Welcome, everyone, to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host. And with me to cover this very cool episode is Missy. Hello again. <laughs> yes. Are we going to be covering Star Wars today? Uh, sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> today, we're actually going to be covering Willow the movie in anticipation of the Willow television show that will be coming out at the end of November. And there's a couple of reasons we wanted to. <laughs> First, Willow is sort of uh, classically known as a critical failure <laughs> in the world of movies. However, it has this cult following it's really, really appreciated by those that grew up with it or saw it in the 80s or even later. And it certainly jives with how Missy and I see the world of Star Wars as well as the world of fantasy and fairy tale. We will be also covering sort of a pre-show for Willow as well as Missy and I will be doing a deep dive discussion of every single episode of Willow as it comes out. So you'll expect that on the, your feed. Uh, we will be covering it on What the Forest. I just feel like it's the best platform for it because what the force is so focused on, uh, you know, meta mythical storytelling and there's a lot to say. <laughs> okay, so what is Willow? Uh, go and watch it on Disney Plus or wherever you can find it if you have not already seen it. I highly recommend it. It is fun, uh, joy in movie form, scary at parts, very scary at parts. Yeah. Complex, beautiful, anti-trope, unique mythic structure in so many ways. And really just worth your time. Mm -hmm. And my kids are younger. They're six and nine. And they watched it and they did really enjoy it. And yes, it has frightening moments, but they did fine. Um, it was, you know, they really liked it a lot. I watched it with my kids as well, 14 and 10, and they both loved it and were making quotes from it the next day. Nice. <laughs> so... <laughs> I mean, that's all you want from a, like their reaction to Willow was actually stronger than any most recent reactions to Star Wars, like of newer Star Wars, which is really interesting. So yeah, believe me, I try. I try all the time. <laughs> Willow was a 1988 movie directed by Ron Howard, uh, written originally. Well, the story was written by George Lucas and the sort of screenplay was uh, finished by Bob Dolman. The music was done by James Horner, which like John Williams, I feel does a lot of heavy lifting in some mm -hmm. of the scenes, especially yes. the action scenes. There's also kind of like a willow sort of main theme that you hear throughout the movie. And it just absolutely just just pops off. It's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it stars Val Kilmer, Joanne Wally, and Warwick Davis, who was only 17 at the time that this was filmed. And yep. in fact, he was only five years older than the actor that played his son. Wow. <laughs> wild. I know. It was great. And Jean Marsh, who played Queen Bav Morda, is still scary to me. Like, I Oh, still she's terrifying. I like, like, yeah. In my opinion, she's scarier than Palpatine. Like, yeah, I mean, she's pretty frightening. I, I <laughs> you know, and I think we can get into the reasons why, but she, she's definitely pretty, pretty terrifying. George Lucas originally conceived of the idea and titled the original screenplay Munchkins. So mm -hmm. I think it, there is like a little bit of Wizard of Oz in it, like a little bit uh, in 1972. So Around the time that he was like working on the ideas for the Star Wars, uh, and it had a similar intent to Star Wars A New Hope, right? He created uh, these sort of mythological and archetypical situations uh, for young audiences. This was meant for kids, right? It's yeah. a coming of age story in so many ways, even though it deals with older people doing these activities. Mm hmm um, eventually, because the movies didn't do well, like kind of in the box office, but did well later, like in DVD and VHS sales and things like that, uh, George allowed Chris Claremont uh, to take on the story he had given him, the, like the rest of the remaining stories that he had in mind. Uh, they're Shadow Moon, Shadow Dawn, and Shadow Star, and they were published in 1995, 1996, and 2000, respectively. During this time, George George was really, really focused on the prequels, 
prequels. Like, this is the lead up to the prequels, and he was working really hard on them. And the books were really disliked by the fans because it killed characters that uh, were main characters. There was a bleak tone to the books. Um, and... <laughs> it's it's reported again how true this is that George disavowed them much mm-hmm. like parts of legends like that was yeah. kind of common for him when when things left his his purview he was like if it di- he didn't like how it turned out it was no longer his <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. um so uh, that being said i don't know how much we're gonna get from that book series to continue in willow the show i think that's mm-hmm. really really important to like say so some of the things that we might be talking about just conceptually that we have read and research on may end up kind of being you know decanonized or whatever in the show mm-hmm. and that's okay we've been through this before this isn't our first lucasfilm ro- rodeo <laughs> What is As canon? They say, canon what is, is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. Canon is subjective. Yeah. Yeah. I love my story group friends. Uh, Val Kilmer was known for improvising many of his lines. So it does have that very like off the cuff in his conversations. And he might have been, I feel like he must have been quite chaotic to work with. Mm-hmm. Probably. <laughs> Um, but he is part of the charisma of the show that makes it very successful so you kind of have to go with it when did you first see willow so actually i was an adult i did not see it as a child i don't i really know the particular reasons why but but for whatever reason i never ended up watching most of the really popular fantasy movies that came out during my childhood. Uh, the only one I, I know I saw as a kid was Never Ending Story. But other than that, Labyrinth, Dark Crystal, Legend, Lady Hawk, all these other movies. Like I didn't see mm. these movies um, as a kid and I didn't see Willow as a child. Um, but when I grew up and I married my husband, who, by the way, is seven years my senior <gasps> age gap. Um <laughs> Hey, a problematic one at that. Exact problematic age gap, I know. But he was like, listen, you have to see all these movies. So we (laughs) we basically just sat down and binged all the films that I had missed um, from the uh, 80s through the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And so I saw it then. And what was interesting about it was I, I loved it. But even though I hadn't seen it as a child, I felt that it gave me a sense of nostalgia because I recognized um just the, the genre feel yeah the, the genre and the, the genre overall. and the and the feeling of the 80s yeah that the comes tone through and yeah the, yeah and everything the style of it it just feels so 80s but it also doesn't feel clunky or dated like to the extent that it does i i would argue the only places you really feel it are like so it was early early phil tippett work yeah and also some of the special effects and how they yeah yeah and some of the effects yeah yeah, some of the effects were sort of like kind of leaning more ray harryhausen i would say Mm -hmm. than like later when you get into like jurassic park and later the effects are are a little dated but just before the major breakthroughs with exactly and so you get kind of what you get for that period of time which is very uh return of the jedi-esque Right. You know. Right. But otherwise, it, you know, um, I think it really holds up well. And um, in particular, I wanted to to call out the fact that most of the film was actually shot in New Zealand. And keep in mind, this was, you know, well before the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yep. It's really cool to kind of see that and realize that like, oh, yeah. And then Peter Jackson came here 20 years later and, and did this again. <laughs> so yeah. it's really cool. New Zealand mm-hmm. being a, a place for fantasy is really kind of interesting. It it yeah. had some scenes shot in the UK, uh, mm-hmm. in Wales and New Zealand. Absolutely. Yep. Um, this was a large part of my childhood. I don't remember if I saw it in theaters or if it just kind of came out shortly thereafter and I rented it from the Blockbuster video. <gasps> Blockbuster video. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but then I ended up owning it. Like my dad either bought me the VHS or the beta tape because we had both at the time and and I would play it, you know, every couple of months. It was mm-hmm. it was as common as Star Wars in my in my household. And um, I used to play Sorsha when I wanted to play up as a fantasy character. It really influenced my view of role playing games. My father was actually a creator of a secondary, lesser known to D and D 
role playing game. And so like I was able to like very much picture myself as a fantasy warrior in those situations because I had a character like Sorsha in my life, you know, as a as something I could picture from my childhood. And it's just great. <laughs> you know, like it just is. And and it's filled with all of this, you know, horror elements in so many ways very very Mm -hmm. scary things yeah but it's funny and charming and full of joy yeah and love and yes and how can you not sort of love it in that way and then also like how much George's story jives generally like with what he has created in Star Wars right so Mm -hmm. George Lucas is incredibly consistent with his messaging across his properties. Even THX 1138 is like, (laughs) has some of the things. American Graffiti has... Yep. The 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 George vibe to it. The vibes are immaculate mm-hmm. for George Lucas. <laughs> um, we have very similar archetypical situations that happen. Um, Willow is a farmer hero from nowhere mm-hmm. who is sort of like discovered by the universe and is taken on uh, you know, an adventure. Uh Laura Dannon herself shares a lot of commonalities with the Death Star plans in A New Hope in the MacGuffin nature of what they do for the story and that you have to protect them and they're in this like very slow moving robot. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, yep. very, very like thing that can't you know care for itself. You know, yes. it is uh, it is weak and needs to be protected from villains. Uh, Mad Mardigan is very Han Solo in his very. presentation, like failed at things and um, has a lot of bravado. Uh, he ends up wooing the princess Sorsha. Uh, Bav Morda is very Palpatine like. Kale is very Vader-like. Rule and Frangine share a lot of tr- similarities to R2-D2 and C-3PO. Yes. Mm-hmm. In their commentary throughout the story to give yep. the audience a brief uh, comic relief, but also uh, as guides to mm-hmm. the audience and to the characters. Eric Thorbear, very much, uh, you know, the longtime friendship with Madden Mardigan, uh, kind of adversarial Reminds us a lot of Lando Calrissian. Yep. And under all of this is the straight up magic of the world, which uh, the High Aldwin himself says, magic is the bloodstream of the universe. Forget all you know. Uh, All you require is your intuition. The power to control the world is in which finger? Okay. This literally reminds me of the Luke conversation on Acto. It Mm -hmm. reminds me of a Yoda and like, like, feel it do you know like everything is interconnected the force is in everything it is Mm -hmm. it is the bloodstream it it is the force this is the magic is in everything and so everything has the power to control it yeah and it's and the mentors aren't teaching you how to magic right they are teaching you to discover the magic in yourself and i love that it's so great and and based on feeling, i.e. intuition. They use yes. intuition in this, which is so interesting because we yep. can talk about that later. And similar to Star Wars under George Lucas's writing, so when George Lucas is heavily involved in the story, um, the world rarely lies to us. Mm-hmm. Right? It is what it is. You know, Queen Bav Morda is an evil queen, you know. Yep. Palpatine yeah. is an evil emperor. <laughs> you know, it is on very safe safe and face value what it is. He ran into some problems in the original trilogy where he accidentally lied to himself and that ended up being <laughs> a lie to the audience. It's fine. Funnily enough, on StarWars.com, there was an April Fool's joke where the world of Willow was named Adowin, uh in a series database entry on April Fool's Day in 2006. <laughs> and it updated the page that indicated the Chronicles of the Shadow War, which is the Crest Claremont, like, published books, uh, would be re- republished as an omnibus one day. And then, <laughs> and, and, and that would add it to the Star Wars continuity. Like, mm-hmm. this is all happening on a Star Wars world somewhere. Yeah, I love uh, that. And, but, you know, they, they quickly took it down and all of that stuff. But in truth, Willow could be a Star Wars world that just Absolutely. never had space travel. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. It, it could just be the magic of the world is just how the force presents itself. So that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let's dig into uh, Willow more specifically. What are some of the genres that you kind of see in this or similarities that are presented? I mean, like it, you know, it's not just that it's fantasy. It's it's that, you know, again, it has those fairy tale elements just like Star Wars does. So, you know, we see all of that, you know, the the evil queen obviously is very uh very fairy tale you see that sleeping beauty and snow white we'll, we'll talk about that later there's a lot of that going on uh you know just motifs like um the three drops of blood is a big yeah. thing like the to enable the transformation uh so we see a lot so again lots of fairy tale references um but then a lot of people have also usually unfavorably of course compared it to lord of the rings and you know some people who are more critical actually you know call it a lord of the rings ripoff i understand why people say that i don't feel that way just because lord of the rings itself is drawing from world mythology and folklore and you know just and like, like willow is like mm -hmm. uh classical uh like uh, music right the yeah. reinhold and yeah like, classic operas that have been around much longer exactly like, tolkien is not original nor is everyone else it's like it's like when right. people argue the origin of vampire stories right Exactly. And so, and it's, and it's important to know that like, you know, yes, the influence was there. We know that George Lucas, you know, read and loved Lord of the Rings. So yes, the influence was absolutely there. And in many cases, it was, pro the callbacks were probably deliberate. There are, there is at least one shot, and I can think of a few actually in Willow that absolutely looks like the fellowship like you mm -hmm. you could swear you're watching fellowship um just because of how it's laid out and the line of people kind of you know trudging off on their journey together on their mm -hmm. quest um those same shots also could be mistaken for uh snow white and the seven dwarfs mm -hmm. because it looks like you know when they cross the log right that's such a, a famous shot of them crossing a log together and so it looks just like that so I, it's very obviously drawing from these things. And I do want to also mention, um, then Willow went on to inspire other uh, films and, and TV shows. I think uh, probably a large amount of like how people view fantasy yeah. in live action because it was more recent than Lord of the Rings. It might have even influenced how Lord of the Rings did things mm -hmm. in its creation, New Zealand being one of the choices, right? So these yeah. things all feed on each other. And George is not even known for doing homage directly in his movies from other movies like The Searchers, like Casablanca. Yep. You know, it, it. this stuff is okay. It's yeah. not just because everything isn't 100% original and you're taking the feelings and the genre or the or the beauty or the shot from one particular thing mm -hmm. it's because you love it and you respect it it's not because you're trying to crib it i guess yeah yeah exactly so anyway so i, I mean you do see a lot of different influences here one of the things i'm going to mention is um there's whereas you know star wars rather famously has a lot of asian influences and there is still some here like in particular you know sorsha's dress like a samurai yeah um you know things like that so there's still some of that here um and and you know i i picked up on a few a few hindu and buddhist and different items that, that appear in it however in general there's a lot more old english yeah um welsh Medi medieval europe yeah Celtic, yeah. like there's a lot more of that going on here for sure. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit of a shift in, you know, the cultural influences, but it, it's all still very recognizable. I also uh, found a lot of uh, like Moses thematically yep. in it with the Laura Dannon's character. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's just because foundling stuff always tends yeah. to fi find things the same, right? So Moses mm -hmm. is the most like well-known foundling story, I think, for Western audiences. And then also Gulliver's Travels because yes. of the fish out of water motif and dealing with people who are giants and people who are little people, like li yep. smaller than you. And it's really interesting that we as an audience um, use Willow as our lens of the world which mm -hmm. is it's so fascinating because then when we deal with the daikini and we deal with the brownies we're actually more likely to deal to identify with both of them which is mm -hmm. yeah i don't know it, it's 
it's great. Like it does a really good job of never othering any of the sentient species. Yeah. Whereas in Star Wars, there's a lot of othering of even sentient species that we uh, might even they never use aliens as Mm -hmm. the prime focus in Star Wars. Yep, the heroes are always human in Star yeah. Wars. Always. 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 You yeah. know? And yeah. Although, you know, of course, Warwick Davis is human, <laughs> his his character is part of a race that isn't in this. And that's unique. Well, it's just, it's, it's going to be, most of the audience is probably not um, little people. And so they would, you know. They're kids, mm- though, and they're little. So there is, and. Right. Yeah. But I, I, I'm, I guess, so this, this is going to get into the whole question of, uh, um, portraying, um, disability in fantasy, Mm -hmm. um, which is too heavy of a topic to get into right now. But, but I will say that making Willow the POV hero. Yeah. Um, was huge. And interestingly enough, I don't know how much that's been done since. Yeah. If at all. If at all, and and again to go to go back to the comparison to Lord of the Rings, no, they cast uh, typically height people, mm-hmm. and then only you uh, uh, you know cast the little people as stunt doubles, mm-hmm. and you know so they were not the heroes of that story, and yep. you know I think that's probably worthy of some consideration and some criticism. Um, but this did, and 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 apparently at the time it was the single largest casting call for a little people ever. Yeah, it was in over two hundred. I think Warwick mm-hmm. Davis has quoted it as like two hundred and forty to two hundred and fifty little. Yeah, it was a lot. Yeah, mm-hmm. like yeah. A lot, so which, and like uh, like Kenny Ken Baker, uh, Kenny Baker, who played R two D two in the original trilogy and up until he died was in the Nelwyn Village. Mm-hmm. It's, it's reported that Peter Dinklage is a character in the Nelwyn village but has never been confirmed but people yeah. are like that's totally Peter Dinklage <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. and and yeah I mean I feel like Willow opens the gates for Peter like people like Peter yeah absolutely absolutely but I just I, I just am so I'm just so glad this movie exists and you know um, it just shows who can be a hero and that's what's great about it. I really want to just kind of set the tone of why Willow is so different than Star Wars. You and mm-hmm. I uh for our power of myth and symbolism episodes with Star Wars uh have talked deeply about feminine concepts. We've done missing feminine, we've done dark feminine, we've talked about snakes and how feminine they are. You know, like we've we've done a lot. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. But Willow itself is like uh, all of the femme power that Star Wars is missing is actually presented in this world. Yes. It's yes. wild. <laughs> it is. It is. It's fascinating. Um, so I do actually have a theory as to why that is. Ooh, do tell. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go into a little history here. Um, so <sighs> George Lucas and his wife at the time, Marsha, um, really struggled to conceive a child. And you know, both very much wanted to be parents, uh, but they really weren't able to have uh, a biological child. So eventually, in 1981, they adopted a daughter, Amanda. And shortly after that, unfortunately, their marriage um, ended. And so now both of them became single parents. George was a single parent. If you listen to interviews with him about that time period, you would think that his wife had died the way he talks about the situation. He does not refer to co-parenting with her. He just talks about being, quote, on his own to raise his daughter, which he was not, but that was how he viewed it at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, that was his perspective. And so then, make sure I get this right. So then 1983 is Return of the Jedi, which is roughly about the same time that his marriage fell apart. And right after Return of the Jedi, he starts, he comes back to his original treatment for Willow, which as you mentioned, he had started in the 70s. And he starts writing again in preparation for for Willow, which eventually was released in 1988. So if the story of Luke Skywalker was psychologically. And yes, we are engaging in armchair psychoanalysis of George Lucas. Sorry. But if the story of Luke Skywalker is 
him working through what kind of adult he wants to be, what kind of man he wants to be as he makes Mm -hmm. that transition from childhood to adulthood. And then later, the prequel trilogy is the exploration of his failed marriage. What went wrong? How did this great love fall apart? You know, why did I lose my bride? Why do I, why do I have a lost bride? You know? Yeah. Um, If that's what that is, then Willow is the story of how do I be a parent to this child? How do I be both father and mother to this child? Because that's how he saw himself. Mm -hmm. And do I have what it takes? Can I be a good parent on my own? I don't know. And so I believe that that's what this story is. Willow feels inadequate as a sorcerer. George, I believe, felt inadequate as a father and he needed to learn to trust his instincts and believe that he could give his children what they needed. So oh my God, that's so fascinating because it, it yes. plays out in the story. Yeah. Like, and in and so it's a baby levels. girl. It's a, a baby, baby girl. girl. They have yeah. to raise this baby girl. You know, Quillo doesn't believe. And he does over and over. You see him not believing that he's the one to take care of her. And over time, he accepts that, in fact, he is the person who needs to care mm-hmm. for her and that he does know how to care for her. And part. I believe that this as a psychological exercise was successful for George because the same year that Willow was released, he adopted his second daughter. Yes. So I think he was like, I can do this. <laughs> and so, he's, a, he's a dad for the fourth time. Like yeah. with, with his wife, which uh mm-hmm. I love. I love that he's like and and that's one of the reasons he sold uh Lucasfilm to Disney was because he wanted to focus on being a dad. Yeah. Which yeah. is so cute. Like he, it's great. he loves being a parent. And if Willow was the practice of working through his stuff out on the page, that's why mm-hmm. it resonates. Because yep. when there's some sort of, you know, kernel of truth to your storytelling that is deep down from within you, it's gonna feel more real. Mm-hmm. Right? Exactly. And I think that's amazing that 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 George is capable of that, that he is able to pull from the deepest, most personal parts of himself and yet present it as this universal archetypical story. That's incredible that he can do that. Yeah. Yeah. And and that he's done it so much. Yep. I think that that's also like something that we we just, you know, George gets a lot of like flack over the years for what he does and how he does it. And he deserves way more respect. Um, And I know that he's gotten a lot more respect in recent years, just as new storytellers have taken on his properties. And people are like, oh, wait, George, although kind of clunky in some places from um, a character perspective, from a directing perspective, really does have that you know, language of our subconscious down. Like he knows how to use that language really well to make it resonate with us. Um, It's so nice to talk about something that was like really George was really heavily involved in again. Yes. I don't know. Yes. It's, it's fun. It's it's fun to know that there's always a little more George to talk about. And but yeah, also to, to bring this back to your original question. Okay, so why is this such a femme focused story? It is, you know, we've talked before about you, you called it the nurturing masculine, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, Mando, of course. I think I, think like, I called it the the masculine nurturing fantasy. Yeah. Like how yes, women have it. a femme power fantasy, right? They want to be powerful. Men as an exploration of their inner feminine or those feminine traits that have been denied to them by the patriarchy really want to explore nurturing and, you know, helping other things grow. Right, right. So to an extent, this is sort of the prototype for that story that we're seeing really frequently yeah. now in Star Wars. Um, of, of how many sort how of, many dads in Star Wars do we have now that are, are so many taking on these like weird, clunky, uh, you know, nurturing fantasy roles? Like so yeah. many. Yeah. And, and yeah, Willow is the prototype, but also Mad Mardigan <laughs> is the prototype in this. Yes. Too. Yes, absolutely. Oh, Important. and I can't wait to get into that. So, <laughs> so I guess the last thing I'll say on on gender before we kind of dive into the the specifics of the movie. Well, is, I want to talk about the mythic structure from a gender perspective. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I, I think yeah. just to kind of like set the set the tone, though, sure, is that because this is George, ex- in theory, exploring his inner feminine. Um, it ends up being a very, I think you called it non-binary story. It it ends up like there's, there is both masculine and feminine 
all characters, whether they are uh, femme or mask presenting, actually, have yeah, have both in the story. It's really fascinating. Yeah. And actually, certain characters that are leaning into more tyrannical roles show more masculine. Yep. Yeah. Because that's the anti of what Willow and George, I guess, needed to become. So mm -hmm. from a mythic structure perspective and, you know, on the rest of what the force, I've talked a lot about Joseph Campbell and the influences on George Lucas. And at this period of time in the 80s, there was an increased movement. And, and specifically, because this was written when Joseph Campbell was actually more consulting with George Lucas directly at Skywalker Ranch, and this was made during that period of time, Joseph Campbell had changed. From when he originally wrote The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which influenced George's view on Star Wars, Joseph Campbell had actually done a lot more internal soul seeking. He had taught at Sarah Lawrence. He had noticed the femme stories and the mythological leanings of his students. And he had also worked really closely with Maria Gambutis, who was an archaeologist exploring the Baltic goddesses of old before kind of the patriarchal overhaul of religion and culture. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And he released a book called Goddesses in the 80s. And at the time, George and Joseph Campbell were heavily in conversations. And uh, before Willow came out, Power of Myth and Symbolism or Power of Myth came out uh, with Bill Moyer and Joseph Campbell. And that was filmed at Skywalker Ranch. So I want to say this is one of the big arguments I have had in the Star Wars universe, uh, which is we cannot stop because George didn't stop with his exploration of the feminine from a mythic archetype perspective. And Willow is the proof. We need to explore feminine mythological stories, but also ones that are considered to be neither. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the original hero's journey, Joseph Campbell didn't call it the hero's journey. It was the hero with a thousand faces who goes on the adventurer's journey. And Willow himself goes on this really unique combined hero, heroine, non-binary journey. And fundamentally, it is just a solid quest for wholeness for Willow, for Mad Mardigan, for Sorsha, for all of the heroes of this story. And it is a separation from the feminine that ends in an integration of the feminine and the masculine in the end. And it's because this is an exploration of what we as a society and a world is actually missing. The world itself, at least to this point, until we discover what happens in the show, is called the mother world. I'm doing the like brain explode thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, you know, I'm going to be trying to highlight key things that happen on both the heroines and heroes journey, because that's what my audience is mostly familiar with. But there are other storytelling ways to kind of view this as long as kind of they go from the known to the unknown and then back transformed. Mm -hmm. It is a mythic structure. That's mm -hmm. that's all I have to say. So um, I'm really excited to dig into it. It's it, really the in the end, when you go on a mythic journey, you are being told you can only be one thing or you are only one thing. And people are trying to stop you from being a fully realized person. Mm -hmm. And the fully realized person is an integration of all of the aspects of yourself together. And yep. we get that in this movie and it's beautiful yes. <laughs> i love it so uh let's dig into the plot i think like uh, plot by plot because i think it'll help us sort of call out all of the mythical elements as we go through the movie and mm -hmm. really kind of set us to talk how it develops as well um yep. the story starts actually with a classic like sort a classic but twisted once upon a time it is a time of dread yes very very star wars like with the you know thing on the, the opening screen. crawl it's like an opening okay. crawl except you know more fantasy styled but yeah it is a time of dread seers have foretold the birth of a child who will bring about the downfall of the powerful queen bavmorda seizing all pregnant women in the realm the evil queen vows to destroy the child when it is born whoa <sighs> 
Love it. And it, it just starts right there with, you know, what what are we up against? You know, it's, we're up against yeah, straight up someone the trying, of the, of yeah, the world. and someone trying to possess the feminine power of creation, right? Like right out the right, gate. Like right they're out the just gate. Yep. Yep. And she awesome. wants to destroy the potential. So let's yep. talk about this evil queen right away, because I think it's really important to kind of set the context. I'm wondering if we're going to get her back during the show, but we'll talk about that in a mm. future episode. Um, in an archetypical way, she is the evil sorceress. Yes. Right. She is like a snow queen mm -hmm. and is a queen from an archetype perspective, of course. Yes. And because she is a, a ruler of a land, psychologically, she is she represents the sickness of the land. So that's always mm -hmm. what happens when you have a king or a queen who is the, um, you know, penultimate ruler of a land. They metaphorically represent the health of the land. So yep. she is this like, um, you know, thing that is killing people and trying to take away the creative force yeah. of the land. <laughs> yeah. And I do want to mention also just, you know, I, so I am going to go into anywhere I was able to find a fairly obvious name reference mm -hmm. um I, I i definitely pulled it i will say that lucas with his um name inspirations tends to play pretty fast and loose with like multiple cultures and mm -hmm, multiple mm -hmm. languages he tends to adapt spellings to to yeah his, like his liking so sometimes that does make it difficult to trace the etymology of some of these names and like what was he trying to do with these names um, but not but he's more, more on the nose than just like, yes yeah he tends to not be super subtle no. um like when he does want to say something he just says it but so so nakmar which is sort of the the land, land fr from from which bav Morda, right she's that's where her fortress is and and you know her soldiers are referred to as nakmar soldiers and then they go out and try to conquer the rest of the land um and so nakmar um, it's like nightmare. Well, it sounds like nightmare, yes. Yeah. And I think that's not accidental. But Mar specifically, so not can mean a few different things, but Mar is the valley created by a volcanic eruption. Ooh. So basically it's been carved out by lava. And, and nothing grows there. Like it's, no, it's kind it's of a desolate. land. It's very it's desolate. This is where like a lot of the Lord of the Rings comparison comes from in that like the, Exactly. You know, that land over the mountains that nothing grows. Yep. And that's why the orcs attack. Yep. Uh, yeah. Um knock also is like night, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, so, it can be knock. It, it's um I you know, like it kind of again, it depends on what translation you're going for. Sometimes it means a very isolated hill right um you know so, so either there, way there's I think, like dark yeah. connotations there's mm -hmm. uh solitary and like nothing grows there so it's like absence yep. of growth and you know you know future in so many ways and right. she herself acts in that way um there is no nurturing in this land only war mm -mm. yeah and she is full patriarchal in in even her dress, mm -hmm. right? She is covered head to toe in like anything that would be considered to be feminine is covered like with her habit and her like, I forget what it's actually called that like, um, it, it was like to protect, like to, to not show your hair from a medieval mm -hmm. perspective so that yeah. like you were not attempting to other people, but she's, she's taken on this like very patriarchal, um, Although feminine in a way, but mm -hmm. she herself is uh, very, very scary and she uses <laughs> violence to control others. Yes. And her and the way that she acts towards Sorsha, her daughter, is she is her commander. She does mm -hmm. not behave like a mother to her. She behaves as a military commander to her. Yeah. You know, Sorsha herself is the daughter of Bav Morda um, because of how uh, Alora is born under the sort of watch of the queen. Both Alora and Sorsha are paired as similar story. Mm -hmm. And they're both daughters of the queen metaphorically. I think yep. that's just really important to say because when they play out from an archetypical perspective, um, it, Sorsha is... Uh, does things that Alora would do in a typical fairy tale once she grew up. Right, right. 
right? So mm-hmm. when Sorsha kind of awakens from Bev Morta's control in a way, uh, Alora, this is what Alora would do in a fairy tale. She would mm-hmm. grow up and become Sorsha and fight against the queen. Right, right. Yeah, yeah definitely. And so it, she ends up being like, like sort of Snow White mm-hmm. in, in both terms yeah so i gave it some consideration and and eventually i did end up like there's definitely the snow white elements for sure and and just Mm -hmm. to be clear for anyone who's listening um in terms of how we categorize folklore snow white and sleeping beauty are the same story yeah um they are now they have over time settled into to two recognizable tale types, but they they still are classified as the same story, the sleeping princess and, you know, is its own thing. And the feminine power that seeks to destroy them is is very similar in both stories. Um, so wh- but that said, I think, and we'll get into this later um, when we talk about, you know, other actions that Bav Morta takes um, in the course of the story. Um, but to me, she felt a lot more Sleeping Beauty okay. evil fairy. She was very Sleeping yeah. Beauty evil fairy. And a lot of that is because of the fact that um, in many versions of the Sleeping Beauty tale, the evil fairy is in some way related to the prince. Right. Usually his mother. Um, and often she's an ogress. And often she does continue to pursue she actually tries to take out her rage on him for betraying her on his children the children of the sleeping princess right and so we see that in this story and like i said we'll get into more detail later but i it's really interesting how they're using those uh uh, motifs here. I also think that it's really interesting that this is a break from sort of the grim fairy tale um, cardinal rule that motherhood is sacred and that yep. a child could never go against or kill their mother. So the Grim mm-hmm. uh, Grim Brothers actually changed all mothers in folklore to stepmothers or witches or sorceresses of some sort. Mm-hmm. And so, but they were never also the mother whereas mm-hmm. this doesn't even play with that they're saying look the evil sorceress can also be your mother yeah and yeah that's just it's really i think a, an important sort of change from um what happens culturally where we look at uh precious feminine rather than mm-hmm. you know that feminine can come and your blood related to it like yeah. evil can come and your blood related to it it's well, it was just an absolute i don't know it it felt a lot like luke i am your father in a in in a change perspective or like a calling out the culture yeah absolutely and and one of the things i want to mention about that is you know it, <laughs> george talks about it in a lot of his interviews but you know people gave him so much grief in the years after um empire for being like wow you must really have some daddy issues huh and like we he always do. joked <laughs> yeah i know he always he was he always kind of responded to that you know by denying it to an extent like no i, I have a great relationship with my father uh, you know it's fine and of course you know Who's to say what's true and what's not? But I think what this movie reveals is a lot of mommy issues going on there too. Like a yeah. lot. <laughs> There's a lot happening there. And and I think that you could look at that not just as, you know, potential feelings about, you know, his Marcia own Levy. mother. Yes. I think mm-hmm. that this, to an extent, this was a projection of how he felt. Again, like he, what actually happened in the way George felt about it don't necessarily align. Yeah. But he felt abandoned. He mm-hmm. felt like, She had left him, had left their daughter. Again, she did not. Let's be clear on that. But that's how he saw it. And so I I really think that he was working through, again, some really strong feelings about, you know, the the mother of his child sort of fleeing in his mind. Exactly. So Um, can we talk a little bit about... Alora and having the birthmark. Yeah. I love this so much. This is like, there's a lot of um, self-fulfilling prophecy in the story, right? So, uh, you know, Bev Morda's advisor, who's like a, a wizard dude, Toady, that like follows him around. It's like, there, there's a, a prophecy that one day she will betray you to Sorsha, right? And mm-hmm. Bev Morda's like, I trust her more than you, you know? Yep. Like, Yep. Uh, but we also have the birthmark on uh, baby Alora and this prophecy that 
one day she will uh, bring about the destruction of Bevmorda, uh, cause a rebirth of the land, and become a great empress. And mm -hmm. she is marked with, it's like a rune on her arm. Mm -hmm. um, it's specifically her right arm, which is really interesting. And also birthmarks are highly, highly associated with uh, royalty. Yeah. So uh, even though Alora is born of random woman mm -hmm. in, you know, wherever <laughs> the Nokmar soldiers found yeah. her, she is from nothing, but is royal, is yes. special. She has magic. She has all of these things. She is powerful enough to uh, save the land, protect it, and cause it to be reborn, which was kind of always what we wanted from Ray, which I yeah. also kind of find fascinating. Yeah. Well, okay. And if you want to talk more about like the Ray parallels, so um, <laughs> the, the, the land, the kingdom that Elora is meant to inherit is called Tyr Aslin. And again, to go back mm -hmm. into like, you know, like trying to dive into the etymology of this, Tyr Aslin sounds a lot like Tyr Nanog, yeah. which from Irish mythology, which is the land of eternal youth. Tyr Aslin, I believe, based on what I've looked up, seems to mean land of dreams. The warriors from Tyr Nanog were called the Tua de Danan, or the children of the goddess of Danu, goddess Danu, sorry. Um, and they were a divine people who possessed great magical powers. Alora is Alora Danon. Yep. This does not feel accidental to me. She is. It does she's not. A, she's a goddess, basically. She's a born. goddess. She's yep. a goddess. And so she is, a, she is royalty of the earth. So she's like, a, in some ways, like a Jesus figure. I like, yeah. that's kind of like, like she is the child of the planet. I guess, or, yeah, the, yes. or the world. Well, but you know, but her name, like, <laughs> her name means Alora, means sun ray, oh, sun or ray. light, Aww. or light. Aww. So she actually, like, her full name basically is Light of the Goddess. Oh, Alora Dan and Light of the Goddess. So, like, this is what I'm talking about. She, so she is. She's like kind of the proto ray. Proto ray. Um, we yay. Love her. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> And, and you know, prophecy is such an interesting thing because it all plays out the way that it says in the prophecy, but not in the mm -hmm. way that we think it is, will, mm -hmm. right? Like, we're like, oh, she'll she'll be brought to tears lean and then be raised and then she'll grow up and she'll become this great leader. But really, it's that she kind of inspires people around her mm -hmm. to, you know, do the right thing because she yeah. is so lovable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who knows what will happen when, you know, we get the show, but... I at least in the context of the show or of this movie, right? We we get this much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, th her, uh, I can't think of the word, midwife. Her midwife uh, takes her away at the pleading of her mother, right? So this is the uh, too good mother death from a wild woman archetype perspective, right? Uh, take her to some place that can protect her, you know, take her away from here is too evil. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the, the midwife is like, okay, now you're my child. <laughs> we're we're yeah. going. Yeah. And it's, it's not. Okay. And this is where I get back into the hole. So, you know, you hear people talk a lot in star Wars about adoption because you know, you have so many dead parents in star Wars that you're always like, Oh, this character is being adopted or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that it appears that because they, they call her the midwife. They also call her the nursemaid. Yeah. So it is suggested that she is, in fact, herself nursing this baby. Yeah. Um, again, it's not totally clear. It, there's a, a couple shots where it looks like she they might also, be sort of feeding her with a pap. Yeah, Willow, a nursemaid, too. So I think it's just a yeah. generic term for person that cares for child. Right. But I think it matters yeah. who's who's feeding feeding the child and how. Because it, yeah. like, it's not clear whether the, the woman is, is body feeding the baby or not. Um, but she could be. And then um, just wasn't able to because it was snowy at that point. Or yeah. Something. And then yeah. and then um, Willow, we see Willow feeding the baby later um, or talking about needing to feed the baby because, you know, the baby's hungry, the baby needs to eat. And then we see with the whole kind of comedic conversation about Black Root with Mad Mardigan, yeah. he's he's sort of feeding the baby and taking on that mothering role and he's actually still dressed as a woman at that point too which he is, is so yeah. like yeah and and there's also some reference to like when he's trying to disguise himself he's got these like fake breasts on and he's holding the baby as if he's yeah. like nursing it so so you know 
we see over and over again that you know it's this concept of of feeding the child, you know, nurturing the child is is really important. So this child has many mothers. It's it, the uh, Alora has her biological mother. She has her symbolic dark mother. She has her sort of first adoptive mother, and then she has both Willow and Mad Mardigan, who are also mothers. And eventually, Sorsha. and then Sorsha. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Eventually, Sorsha. So like. There's everyone in in this entire movie eventually is oh and uh, and Kaya sorry Kaya's a mother too Kaya well, yeah as Kaya well mothers her too yeah 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 uh, so like so but many I also mothers. think that that's like Kaya is Willow and so that's yeah. that's a that's a different thing but I actually think yeah. this is really important myth- mythologically and also like metaphorically for the story symbolically right so Alora represents the hope of the future of the planet. Alora yes. is the planet. Alora is the future, right? Yes. So symbolically, she's the future ruler, which when we get a future king situation, they are already queen, right? They are mm-hmm. already the empress. And so by having all of these people become the parents and the nurturers mm-hmm. of it, they are bringing about the future. Yes. And and this is what, you know, you, you talked about Moses before. This is what the, the story with the child set adrift. That mm-hmm. is what that tale is about. And it appears other places too. Aside from Moses, um, well-known stories of the child set adrift in the basket are uh, Akkadian King Sargon, Hindu hero Karna, um, more modern tales like Kal-El. Kello, you yeah. know, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so, so yeah. The, like the child set adrift in the basket when all is falling apart, like that is, you know, it indicates faith in the future. You tr- you're mm-hmm. trusting that the future represented by this child will come to pass and will be good. And, and that there is not all just darkness out there. So yep. that's like a common thing with Kal-El. Like they mm-hmm. shoot them off into space and trust random humans. Yep. This, this woman, this nursemaid um, slash midwife has no idea the baby's going to be okay, but she is out of options and so sends her on basically to have the world care for her and and bring her where she needs to go. And she goes yep. to the Nelwyn vi- village, which is so good. It's so good from an archetype perspective because yep. it's like the maybe the last safe, hidden, protected, pure place that hasn't been touched by Nokmar, i.e. Mm-hmm. This, this desolate darkness. Yep. So it, guess, it, what, guess what Nelwyn means? What does Nelwyn mean? Nelwyn means daughter of the winner. It's another feminine power. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like everything. It's all about feminine power. This whole movie. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I can't stop thinking that George is writing this at, while he's talking to Joseph Campbell when Joseph mm-hmm. Campbell had gone on his, you know what? Feminine stories deserve a little bit more. Like it, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's amazing. So good. And I'm not even done. I'm not even done with the feminine names. There's more. It's so oh, good. Fun. Good, 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 good. Okay. <laughs> so um, the children find the baby and call for yes. their father, who is a simple, unawakened uh, farmer you would pass by as an NPC in, an, in a video game RPG. <laughs> <laughs> he's unsuccessful he's kind of like jack and the beanstalk in so many ways like he he hasn't run into the situation that changes his fate the the thing um farming is symbolically related to cultivation right so you're trying to grow things but you're not growing the right things mm-hmm. right he's trying to grow seeds that he's found in the forest which are like just the things that are around you and part of this is an indication that he needed to go out and find a unique seed, a special yes. seed, a mm-hmm. again the Jack and the Beanstalk concept, right? Uh, and the land itself is unfertile, or you don't have the skills, uh, or you're not growing the right crops. And so, what are the crops that Willow needs to grow? Well, he needs to cultivate himself. That's mm-hmm. the key. and he can only do that with the magic seed, which is a Laura Dannon that shows up at his river door, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, rivers. So um, that's another thing. So in world mythology, rivers often represent the future because they, they, you Bring know, things. represent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's the passage of time, you know, it, like yep. the flow, the flow generally cannot be stopped, you know, uh, unless you have a dam, which is a whole other sim- symbol. 
but the the river is like it will continue on beyond yeah, it, all of us. It also has a has a like uh, a metaphor for magic and the force, mm-hmm. right? Like there's yes. river flow, things like that, fate. It all kind of ties in together in mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Um so it, Against his will, Alora becomes part of his family, right? Because mm-hmm. the rest of the family adopts her. Yep. Instead of the children, he's like, nah. Uh, he has that brief interaction with Burglecut, which um, has become my, my kid's favorite <laughs> character name. Yep. It's a great uh, name. He's so good. He's just like hateable. You're like, I hate this guy so much. Because yep. he's like, I'm going to own your farm and set you to the mines. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like Burglecut represents the perspective that willow has of himself yes yes it's all of his doubts sort of projected onto this person who wants to you know tell tell him he can't do it and he's going to fail yeah like you you and i are you know aware enough to be like oh hey we're projecting our own Yep. <laughs> Shadows <laughs> on to somebody. But that's exactly what Burklecut does. Burklecut does all of the things and shows all the insecurities and all of the baggage that Willow starts the the adventure with. But against his will, Kaya and the children, the bobbins. I love yes. that they're, they're, so they're nicknamed the bobbins. They're, they're adorable. adorable. These children that played these roles. Like you're like, Oh, yeah, I want to get back to my bobbins. Yeah, they're yes. adorable. <laughs> they're so cute. Well, and they're great, too, because, you know, to your point about how, like, you know, there are no one lies in this story, really. Yeah. Um, you know, know how they're like, oh, you know, daddy, what if you're going to meet uh, trolls and dragons? He's like, no, 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 no. And then, like, later, and he brownies meets and dragons. And fairies. Yeah. And you're yeah, going to get exactly. under a fairy's magical spell. Yeah, yeah. they're like, oh. You know, yeah, and and they're they like they're everything. excited for his story, and he's like, "No, I'm just trying to live my life." Okay, mm-hmm. so this is the big Joseph Campbellian thing, which is you feel like like you're trying to live your life the way society tells you. Yeah. Willow is kind of walking the right-handed path from a Campbell perspective. He's like, "I go to work, I take care of my family, I have my hobbies on the weekend, and that's the way it is." He does have mm-hmm. a dream. Dream that he is he's like scarcely believes in himself which is to become a, ma- a real magician or a real sorcerer he feels like he has it like underneath him but he doesn't actually feel like he has the right to do that mm-hmm. right but his joy is to become a sorcerer yep and so he needs something to snap himself out of this uh, situation and what he is experiencing yep. and that joy comes literally in the protection and the love of somebody who is just as special as he is Mm because everybody is special that's that's key like he sees himself in her and things like that so that's that's key yeah but kaya's like no are you kidding me we take care of children like yeah (laughs) yeah this is our, this is who we are. Yeah. Yeah. So she, it's so great. And then when she tells him to to hold the baby and he's like, no, no, I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> it's so great. It's so good. And then they they have the uh, sort of weekend festival or the, the festival that's happening. And so they all go there and we get to see the disappearing pig trick on stage that doesn't go mm-hmm. successfully. So it's mm-hmm. like a little piglet. It's so cute. The little piglet. And he's like doing ah! the trick and it's it's not successful um and this is so key because this gives us the full circle journey of willow Mm -hmm. in 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 discovery so we have to remember the the disappearing pig trick yes it's so reminds us yeah but then there's the uh you know high aldwin calls all the candidates to the stage yeah to be like i will take an apprentice and this is the classic failure to trust your your own power. And this is where it ties into more of a heroine's journey storytelling mm-hmm. in that the power is within you the whole time, Willow. Yep. <laughs> Because he's, you know, I said this, the quote at the beginning of it, where is the power to control the world? Which finger? And his instinct, 
we find out later was to point at his own finger. And Warwick Davis does such an amazing job of like looking at his own hand. Yes. And then looking at the high wall ones and then choosing the wrong finger and then him being like broken. Yeah. Like, oh, I should have gone with my original. Yeah. Yeah. Um, intuition. And you and I have talked about a, this a fair amount in different media things like specifically um <laughs> red panda power in turning yep. red <laughs> yes but, uh intuition is the wisdom of the world mm -hmm. right we get it from our bones and it is a feminine traditionally associated power this doesn't mean men can't have like the intuition but like the the adage is women's intuition yep right and so magic as mm -hmm. we see later on comes easier to women yeah 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 it, it's fascinating and okay so because magic thing... represents rebirth life cultivation nurturing all of yes this. it's yeah. transform it's transformation transformation and so yeah. so yeah definitely um, and what's interesting is, you know, shortly after this scene, you know, uh, he sort of consults the bones for what they should do. Right. <laughs> and yeah. as we've discussed repeatedly, uh, if you've listened to any of other other episodes, the bones possess wisdom. They are sort of, uh, you know, the they contain all the history and wisdom and knowledge of the world. And so it makes sense that he consults the bones, but there's a twist on it in this, because in this one, he actually says, the, the bones, bones tell me nothing. nothing. The bones yeah. tell me nothing. And he turns to Willow and he asks him, do you have any love for this child? And that is what answers the question about whether or not Willow should take the baby mm -hmm. on as ultimately. And he does. Yeah. Right. What is your, what, like, what is the true wisdom here? The true wisdom is, your do feelings, you have, yes, that love. love, that nurturing instinct. Yeah. And if you do, then that's the magic, right? Yeah, and I, so I loved that. It's great. And we, we know that the their world, the Nelwyn world, it needed to be woken up from its insular situation, right? So that's where mm -hmm. the devil dogs like come and attack. Yep. And it's really, really important that the Nelwins themselves uh, view themselves as part of the larger world. And this is very classic Campbell as well, which is that the um, the world itself, the, the thing is wrong with the world, right? There's a sickness yep. or there's an attack or something like that. And so a hero has to leave the world they came from into the unknown mm -hmm. to be able to solve the problem and then bring back the elixir yes. to the world to their home and transform their home as well yes their, their home does not believe that power can come from nowhere mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and so that's part of what has to change um and so he decides to set out and yeah, he's the first signer up. And then um, High Alwyn basically forces Burglecut and yeah. the other warriors of the village to protect uh, Willow, including Mel um, Migosh, who's his best. Yes, Migosh. Migosh is the Sam to his Frodo. And I love it. Yeah, it's so cute. It's so cute. And I do want to mention briefly, I did find mm -hmm. a quote from George Lucas um, where, you know, when he was just asked, what is Willow about? And I think it's great because it really emphasizes what you're saying about being part of the larger community. Mm -hmm. He says, Willow is about commitment. It's about compassion, about taking responsibility for what goes on in the world. And it's about an every man who comes up against extraordinary circumstances. Oh, so man. like, it's very obvious that he was very seriously considering at this point in time, not just his own personal story, but, you know, how can you have an impact on the world around you? Because we're all connected yeah. and you can't stay in your own little village. You can't stay on the farm, Luke. You have to eventually take responsibility and, you know, try to do what you can. And this is exactly what all George Lucas stories do, which is that the inner transformation equals the outer transformation. And the outer transformation helps you in your inner transformation because the macro and the micro are connected. Mm -hmm. You are not separate from the world and the world is not separate from you. Yep. All people matter and all journeys need to be taken by somebody in the larger world. It's yep. it's good. It's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Love um, it. I just want to um, eh, briefly talk about the braid because I know that you have some thoughts on it, but it mm -hmm. really – so Kaya, uh, as, as Willow is about to leave, she presents um, – 
Willow with uh, a talisman of sorts, which is her long hair, which he loves on her, Mm -hmm. uh, presenting it to Carrie with her. And it really gave me, because this is like a a massive indication of the separation from the feminine, uh, like Vasilisa's doll in... Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. You know, in in all of the Baba Yaga stories that yep. she has, he's carrying with her or with him the reminder of his conscious, his conscience, his intuition that he needs to trust himself to return yep. home. Yes, it's just so good. And in the Vasilisa story, the doll was gifted to her by her mother. Yes. So it is again, you know, that mother figure, and then carrying carrying that feminine intuition with them on their journey. Yeah. Um. The significance of it being specifically a braid and not some other talisman uh, is that a braid is typically a symbol of a rope indicating the two characters are tied together. So the obvious place, yeah, the obvious place you see this is, uh, you know, Rapunzel, like, you know, she's tethered, she's tethered to her, uh, you know, the, the witch, her mother, she's tethered to the prince. You know, yeah, and uh, then Ariadne's string to get you out exactly. of the maze. Exactly, uh, same thing. String mm-hmm. of fate to that you're connected with the, your loved one. Yes, you know things like that. So yeah, yeah. So there's that, and then the other thing too is that hair symbolizes thought because it comes from the head. So Kaya is indicating that her thoughts will be with Willow, and when he touches it at later points in the story, he sort of you see him kind of you know in moments of doubt he touches the braid. He's you know, he knows his thoughts are with her. Her thoughts are with him. Yeah. They are tied. Connected. And so it's really beautiful. Tied on the end of a string. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, so good. So good. And subtle, you know, like, and like, oh, give him a braid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They start their journey out and it, it, they do a really good job of kind of like showing how large their world is to get out mm-hmm. of even the just the Nelwyn area because it takes like, yeah. they do several cuts of it feeling like days and days and days to get to the crossroads yep. um, and there's this kind of moment where you know Willow's like oh you know Al- we need to stop Alora needs to eat uh, and Burgle Cut's like you know <laughs> <laughs> Why do we need to stop? And he picks up the baby and the baby like throws up on his face. Yeah. Um, that was not in the original script. Yeah. This was this is actually something happened because the babies uh that were used for Willow as like Alora, the twins, were actually growing too fast for certain scenes that they had to reshoot. This scene, they actually used a more newborn baby. Uh, that was like just like one of the producer's babies or something yeah, yeah. like it was it was like not an unexpected baby and uh when the actor picked up the baby the baby had just eaten and just straight up that is baby vomit all over yeah. that actor's face <laughs> And they, they were like, actually, this is really great. And it ties in at the end, mm-hmm. too, right? So, like, uh, Alora did not like uh, Burkle Cut. So that's mm-hmm. really funny. Uh, and um, they end up getting to the crossroads, which uh, the crossroads represent the threshold to me mm-hmm. from a mythic perspective. Like, Yes, absolutely. It, everything is scary. Yeah. Like, there's bones. There's prisoners they're soldiers like they're like mm-hmm. and they're they're kind of like by the wayside the world is not built for them this is this yeah. is too scary yeah well and they they reached what they expected to be the end of their road and discover death yeah like that's what's there um i also want to mention this is the scene that um i don't know why i'm suddenly forgetting his name um lowry says that uh, he was inspired by in the green knight Mm -hmm. Um, He actually has uh, some shots in The Green Knight, which are, according to him, a very direct reference to the scene at the crossroads, um, you know, at a similar point in Gawain's journey. Exactly. Which is saying, saying you have to make that decision to pass into, you know, to to cross a threshold and to pass into the other world. And death being there, because sometimes the guardian of the threshold is like a dragon. Sometimes it's... Mm -hmm. It, it, it it's scary because in in truth in mythical journeys transformation requires death mm-hmm. like you have to kill the old version of yourself to be a new version and so mm-hmm. that's why there's so much death around this but he is introduced to a not quite dead figure of Madag Mardigan who's played by Val Kilmer who is in so many ways the classic soldier uh but also rogue like type yes 
thief like character mm-hmm. like he's he's kind of um merc- mercurial yeah in his presentation mm-hmm. well he's he's it's so interesting his introduction is fascinating because it's full of contradictions on the one hand you you very quickly realize that he's really only out for himself he's very selfish mm-hmm. um it's obvious that he's kind of you know abandoned his homeland or been kicked out <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> one of those. Um, you know, obviously he's gotten in trouble for something he did. He, you know, he's. It, we know that he's just trying to do anything to get himself out of this cage. Uh, it's all very obvious. But then on the other hand, he does seem to very quickly show genuine affection for the baby. And when he finds out from Eric, you know, what has happened to their kingdom, he's he's upset by it. He obviously seems, you know like yeah. very upset to hear what happened to his home. It's just kind of fascinating the way that you, he's immediately presented as that rogue with a heart of gold. You get that yeah. right away in his it's very Han Solo. <laughs> yeah, super Han Solo. Extremely Han Solo. Yes. Like mm-hmm. he, and, and sort of he ends up taking on the, I've never found my right path. And that's why yep. I'm in the cage. Like I- At a crossroads. At, at a, a crossroads. crossroads, right? Yeah. And- and the decision to take Alora with him is actually part of his fate because he's like, I'll take care of her and I will make her my own, which in in a fairy tale sense means he will. It's like yep. your word is your bond in this world. If you mm-hmm. say you will do something, you will that will become your fate. And he does yeah. end up becoming her father in yep. the end, which is yep. so great. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And it, it's also fascinating, too, because you go back to the the way that this story treats gender and, you know, who has nurturing instinct in this story. You know, when he says that he'll take the baby, the the Nelwins say, well, you don't know, you don't know how to care for a baby. And he goes, no, but I know women who do. But then later it ends up being that wasn't the right choice. Yeah. And you know, he's not supposed to take her and pawn her off on someone else. He's supposed to find that nurturing in himself yeah, and care for that baby. And so, you know, again, we kind of go back to it's, it's it, um, just like Alora and Sorsha have parallel journeys and are mm-hmm. parallel characters. So are Mad Mardigan and Willow. Yeah. They're on parallel journeys to discover that they're feminine. Yeah, exactly. And Mad Mardigan gets uh, so many good anima oh, moments in so this. Good. It's so good. so good. Val Kilmer just slays in this role. He does. He like, honestly, this would not be the same movie without him. He's so good. He's so charming. Like it's I love the funny. way that Yes. Like scary when he's angry, but also like yeah. understandable. Like I could actually see Val Kilmer as a Han Solo, which is yeah, oh, absolutely, wild, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, it's so good. Well, and even just the way that he's able to, you know, because I, I love when uh, uh, you know they don't believe him that he's that he's anyone special, but then he tells them with total confidence, "I am the greatest swordsman who ever lived." And then later, when it's revealed that he is in fact a very skilled swordsman, yeah. yeah it's so funny because Will is like, oh, you are great. And he like gives him this big goofy grin and then slips and falls on his ass. And so <laughs> it is, it's just like the fact that he's able to do that to make you believe that he's this, you know, incredible warrior. And at the same time, a total doofus, you know, and it's it's so fun. It really is. There's there's one moment later on when him and Willow are are walking and I just want to call it out now, which is, you know, uh, Willow's like, I'm the greatest sorcerer who ever lived. And she's yeah. a princess. And he says, I'm the king of Kashmir. My kids were literally <gasps> yes. like, is he? Because like, <laughs> no, no, seriously, because people yeah. don't lie in this story. <laughs> I know. And so they're like. Wait a second, is he actually the king of Kashmir? And like I showed you the like the Willow map for that's it's mm-hmm. from like Shadow Moon and stuff like that. There is actually yeah. a location called Kashmir, but I, I suspect Valkyrie McKillimer ad libbed that line. Like yep. it's just fascinating. So now I'm like, wait, maybe maybe he's like the prince of Kashmir or something. That would be cool. Where he's like the future of the world and so thus deserves Princess Sorsha and you know, mm-hmm. like in, in the fairy tale. He, he's know, the secret logic. the secret the secret prince, right? Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it'll be interesting to see if that ever comes out in the show or uh, it'd be something. cool to see. You know, I want I know Val is not Val Kilmer is not doing so great. Um, but I really would love to see him in the show. As of about two years ago, though, um, there was some conversation about, you know, that they had tried to include him 
in the filmmaking process for the show. And it wasn't clear to me if they, if they meant in the writing or, mm. you know, in maybe what they choose to do with his character, like, like what giving sort him of options or something. Like yeah. That. No, it was really just great to see him. Top Gun Maverick. Top Gun Maverick, which watch that movie if you haven't. Oh, that movie is so good. Yeah, Excellent. It was really great to see him in that. Mad Mardigan takes Alora and he's like, you know, he loves her instantly. Mm -hmm. He cares, but also maybe trying to go about things in the wrong way, like finding a woman to take care of her and stuff like that. Yep. And so M me. Migosh and Willow are like, yay, we're going back. And this is like, this is, this is literally the denial of the call. <laughs> yes. Yes. Like, yes. We're not going to go back to the crossroads. We're going to go home. But it's, you know what, that to your point about it being both the hero's journey and the heroine's journey, though, it's the de denial of the call. Yes. But it's also the point at which at first Willow believes his journey is over. Hey, I did mm -hmm. it. I did yeah, the I did thing it. I'm supposed to do. And yep. then as he's as he's starting the journey back with Migosh, he's questioning. He doesn't feel comfortable with it. So yeah. that the illusionary becomes, boon. Illusionary yes, boon. Yeah. Like exactly. the idea that like I did this. Why don't I feel any sort of fulfillment? Yep. Because yep. you were playing with the boys club, right? You weren't yep. doing the feminine choice. Yeah, exactly. So, Exactly. It's so cool to see this this play out. And so then we get the intervention of the supernatural, mm -hmm. right? Supernatural helpers come along and basically steal Alora back. So we get the brownie introduction Yay! of Rule and Frangine. <laughs> who are the best oh my god <laughs> i love them so much and they're they're, they're so riding fun. on a bird and they've stolen yes. the baby and it's like we have the baby, <laughs> <laughs> we have the baby. <laughs> so great <laughs> i love brownies i used to be a brownie uh, same uh in in girl guides in canada and uh <laughs> it was just it was such a unique thing to because girl guides themselves are like very much like Boy Scouts, right? Like the, yep. the just girl versions of it. Um, yeah. The brownies have like this whole mythological, I don't know, it, ritual behind them. Like mm -hmm. all of the guy, like the older uh, parents that help guide the brownies. These are brownies are like younger girl guides, right? And mm -hmm. they wear brown and they all have different names, but all of the um, older uh, women or mothers who have helped the brownies with their organization are all birds mm -hmm. and they all give them like um there's a lot of like toadstool stuff and like yep. like like just uh, talk about a weird interjection of fairy tale elements into young women's lives yeah well, uh, <laughs> up. as we've talked about before about rituals that that have you know cultural rituals that have died out to an extent you know of marking yeah marking major uh, milestones in your life. So you don't get that as much, but yeah, no, it's a great point. And the, so the brownies, uh, you know, they originate from Scottish folk folklore. Um, they're sort of a type of hobgoblin. Yeah. And, uh, and often things, like house helpers or yes, like specialty. Well, they're things. associated with the hearth, yeah. which is like home where the family is. And so I feel that here in this instance, the brownies are, you know, helping to form Alora's new family. Yeah. By by joining in. Um, another quick note: they are attracted to milk or cream, which is, I, I believe, why they were like, "Oh, a baby." There's always milk around a baby. Yeah. <laughs> so they were like, "Yeah, let's do it." Um, and they love to play mischievous pranks. So the brownies are, you know, a pretty straightforward, direct interpretation of of folklore. And they re report to a fairy queen, which is yep, also exactly. like fo folklore yes. solid. And and mm -hmm. so they bring the baby to the fairy queen, uh, Chandralin, or Shan how do you, Sher 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 Sherlindria. 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 Okay. All right, so they, back they to bring the her to... They bring her to the fairy queen, Sherlindria. Sherlindria. So back to the whole name thing. This is the only name where we actually know exactly where it comes from. <laughs> um, this is from, so the audio commentary for Willow um, by Warwick Davis, apparently he did talk about this. It is a combination of three real women's names. Um, they were Cheryl, Ron Howard's wife, Linda Ronstadt, the famed singer and friend of George Lucas. What? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And Andrea, the scriptwriter Bob Dolman's wife. So Cheryl, Cheryl, Linda, and Andrea, Sherlindria. And what I find 
crazy about this is back to the whole thing of this being a femme focused story. These were the goddesses of the creator's lives. These were their yes. goddesses who they have now made together into the goddess or fairy queen. The fairy queen, yeah. And she is sort of this, the wild mother of, mm-hmm. of the story. So she is giving Willow the right to care for the princess by saying, mm-hmm. you have Alora's consent. Why aren't you going and doing this? <laughs> yep. Oh, you need a little bit more power. Here is the most powerful tool of all, my personal wand. Mm-hmm. Please bring this to um another powerful femme mentor Finrizel yep. and then take her to Tirasleen where a good king and queen will look after her and she can fulfill her destiny oh so good nothing about how that's gonna happen yes but it does happen mm-hmm. right um I really love that the the wand is sort of like a lightsaber for mm-hmm. uh Willow and later on he ends up getting the ultimate boon right mm-hmm. like this is this is his I don't know how to use this thing thing uh i don't understand my burgeoning burgeoning new powers yeah yep. that's great yeah um, well and it's it's interesting because it's you know he's given the one but his his job is simply to transport it yeah. for someone else to use and so it's still it's about he personally doesn't feel ready to use it yet. he doesn't feel ready to use his magic yet yeah and his own internal power right mm-hmm. so it's very similar to ray like she's given luke's yeah. um lightsaber to take to luke yep <laughs> but yeah. really it's for her to use in the end yep. well it's um, called to her yeah exactly uh and and that's the same with destiny and willow like if something comes to you it's for you um yep even if you don't know how to use it yet i also love that this is the most direct uh gulliver's travels yes i loved that moment where it's literally like the lilliputians have tied mm-hmm. him down and, yes! and captured him and things like that and and this is supernatural intervention in that you thought you were going home you know you have an emotional longing to go in a different mm-hmm. direction and so supernaturally we're going to take you and put you back on the right path yeah yeah. And it's also the most distinct moment where, you know, again, you become super aware of uh, the fact that you're getting this story from Willow's point of view. And so mm-hmm. he is a character in a world with both tiny people and giants. Mm-hmm. You know, and dragons. He, he, and yeah, dragons. and dragons. But he is he is himself, you know, sort of, uh, he is normal. He is the standard for yeah. his world. And so he's aware of, you know, the Daikini, which are much larger than him, and then the uh, the brownies, which are much smaller than him, and that he mm-hmm. occupies this sort of middle range as part of that sort of community with all these different people. And it's different from the Lord of the Rings in in that perspective, because the hobbits are always the smallest. The smallest, whereas yeah. because of the position that Willow is in, he ends up becoming the protector of the large and the small. Yes. Yeah. Which is so cool. Like the fact that he... He has to protect those smaller than him, mm-hmm. you know, and it's it's definitely, like you said, very different from the way the hobbits are portrayed. Yeah, exactly. Because the, the hobbits are always protected by others that are mm-hmm. larger than them, whereas it, Willow understands that there are creatures that are smaller than him that yeah. also Aww. need to prote- be protected. And uh, the good fairy tells him that. So mm-hmm. he he goes back uh, on his journey. He's got Alora back. Um the brownies are hilarious. This way to the island, and, and <laughs> Rule is like, nah, 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 this way, and he's like, this way to the island. <laughs> are you sure? With us, nothing will go wrong. <laughs> I love their like incredible overconfidence. I just they're them. so cute. Well, I, I want to make sure though before we get to the island that we definitely focus oh, no. on. Um, we're gonna talk about the tavern. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just, All right. Just making sure. All yeah. Right. But they're he- they're. They're, they just start on their journey, right? Got like, it, got it. Okay, all right. Yeah. My bad. And then, um, so they, they, they're they like, oh, she needs milk. It's raining. Like, everything is terrible. He's tromping through the woods. And they yeah. come across a tavern. <laughs> like the which, cantina. Like the cantina, <laughs> yeah. And they enter in. And, and this, to me, is the official threshold. Because mm-hmm. he enters into an unknown world where everything, he doesn't fit anything. Everything mm-hmm. is different. And he doesn't understand anything. Yep. 
Yeah. Well, and we start to see a change up to this point. You have, you know, he's sort of continued with his, you know, his, he's always continuing with the refusal of the call over yeah. and over and over again. This and even though accepting he's, it going in and making yes, a choice. Yes. So yes. it's really key. And we come in and the fairies are like over or the brownies are overwhelmed. And, uh, you know, one gets smacked in the face with the fairy, uh, fairy love potion, uh, which is the dust, dust of, of brownies. Broken hearts. <laughs> yep. Love it. <laughs> so it's both it's both uh destruction and creation in it. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's fate change potion. Yeah, like it's fairy dust, right? Yes. But so Yay. good. But R- rule sees the cat and starts to um seek them seek out the cat, and it's because like this is foreshadowing for Mad Mardigan and Sorsha, right? Mm-hmm. The cat wants to kill you know the the innocent lovemaker, uh, but it, there's an attraction there nonetheless, and um this is huge because Campbell actually talks about love potions and this is my my plea to writers that maybe you should start including them because as a society we have lost the uh it seems the ability to um like choose that attraction is actually important so Mm -hmm. in the myth uh Tristan and Isolde which is the one that um Campbell loves so much. This was the first time from a medieval storytelling perspective that two characters chose love, attraction, even, you know, sexual romance <laughs> over duty and obligation to the society and to the church. Mm-hmm. So the potion um although kind of ambivalent in its, you know, distribution, unravels the taboos and traditional boundaries of illicit and licit feelings and emotions and it allows characters to have the privilege of attraction over all other considerations hey we're enemies eh, well, so what you know yep. oh you know and and it thus allows the conflict to realistically happen between pitting the needs and desires of individuals over the needs of the society that they necessarily come from and that puts into direct conflict that potions are both dangerous and destructive and also create love. So mm-hmm. that's why it gets both names in the story. Yep. So cool. Yeah. <laughs> Ugh, I love it. I love it. And it, it's it I think that you know again if you want to make the Star Wars comparison, I feel like it serves a similar purpose as the Force Bond. Oh, absolutely. Between yeah. Kylo and Ray because it it is what forces these two opposed characters into proximity where you know it's they they are forced but in some means to set aside their animosity mm-hmm. and, and they can't so that each other in yep they can right, but exactly. yeah they don't because it off moors it it unmoors both characters if one yep. character is affected by it and you know the the first most famous love potion of course is cupid's arrow right yes and and it it has this metaphoric uh, association with that moment by which something changes Mm -hmm. with us and and how magical that actually is and how it feels like it comes out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And we need more of that in the world. I agree. I agree. I think uh, love at first sight needs to make a big comeback. I I'm a big fan personally. I, I love a lot of stories that have love at first sight. Um, I think that if done well, it could be super successful. Um, A more recent example, I think, where it was done really, really well was uh, the 2015 Cinderella. Like, Uh, they they meet one time, they have one scene, and they're wildly in love. And you know that by the time they meet again at the ball. And I want more of that. I think that's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) It's great. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm all for it. It Yep. It's realistic. I mean, it, yeah. listen, it does happen. Like, uh, you know, to go back to my totally problematic marriage, as we've discussed, um, I, my husband asked me to marry, marry him after we had been dating for two weeks. Yep. So like, I knew I would not, marry my husband when I first met him. Bam. See, it's not yeah. unrealistic. I love when people are so unrealistic. No, it's not. 
no, it's not. <laughs> it totally happened. It, so it, it I, does I happen. It. And then you deny the call and you're like, oh, wait, mm-hmm. now we have to have two years of trying to figure out what this actually meant when you had this first feeling right away. Yeah. Well, because you, yeah. and at that point you, you know, you come in and you think that's crazy. I can't do that. That's, you yeah. know, like I can't follow those instincts. And that's not to say that it would be the right choice to, you know, to jump um, when you have those feelings, but it is interesting how you can still end up your initial instincts being correct even if it takes you time to accept it. Exactly. Uh, From this point, we have uh, Willow running into Mad Mardigan as he's trying to take care of Allura. Uh, And Mad Mardigan is in the process of getting into woman's clothing. Yes. After I believe he just um, did things with a married woman. Yes. (laughs) So I mean, like, yeah, they don't mess around. In this uh, in this movie, and I'm pretty pretty direct about what's happening. But yeah, so he's he's getting into the um, you know his his disguise, which means that when he meets Sorsha, he's dressed as a woman, and she arguably is dressed as a man because she's wearing the samurai outfit. Yeah. So it again, we have these you know playing with gender roles and everything, and it's it's really cool. It is absolutely, and she sees right through him right away, which is great. But mm-hmm. I do, you did already point out the the moment when uh, he takes Alora and you know cradles her in front of the husband. Yep, you know, and the husband's like, you know, oh cousin, yeah, you know. But um, Mad Mardigan uses that sort of predictability of a traditional Mm -hmm. uh person traditional man in the society as a weapon yep yeah which is great so it's great he is revealed he knows he's going to be called out so he uses he knows and he like kind of like signals to the guy like Mm -hmm. i was actually a guy sleeping with your (laughs) yeah sleeping with your wife yeah exactly and it's like uh gentlemen meet whatever his name is <laughs> yeah 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 exactly it's it's so great and then but it, but i mean you know back to the whole thing of like no one really lies in this story you know what does sorsha ask him when she sees him before she realizes you know that he's a man she goes is that your child yeah. she, i think she says woman is that your child woman, so already your child? She, yeah already she's you know named him as a mother which as we've said he is as all yeah. the characters in this story are he is also a mother to Alora. so it's just it's so cool the way that you know all these these truths are just out there boldly in the text of the film they have an epic uh cart escape with the brownies and willow and all of the drum of like oh no the rains have fallen and and mad yep. again like fighting the bad guys mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. from Sorsha's uh, like little cohort there. And then in his pink dress, in, in his, his pink, pink dress, dress, dressed as a woman with his long <laughs> hair. It's yep. so good. I love it. It is. It and, is. and they escape. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Willow for the first time, Willow has to do something that is heroic. He, he can no longer, he's realized he can no longer pass off the heroism to other people. Mm-hmm. He has to do it. And so he finally steps in and, and has this heroic moment. So him and the brownies are like, well, we're heading to the island. And, you know, Mad Mardigan has this spark of like looking at Alora Dannon and realizing, oh, no, I still I'm still tied to Alora. Yep. Right. Yep. And he looks down at her and he's like he stands up and he's like, oh, no, I'm going that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, no, your path is my path. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Yeah. Yeah. Which is is like, is beautiful from like a mythic structure perspective to say that your journey coincides with my journey and we're both on the same journey. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I love it. I love it. There's also a brief moment in here, um, kind of, you know, between the montage of them traveling where it cuts back to Bav Morda, you know, getting the reports from her generals and they haven't yeah. found the baby. And she's she's yelling at her all of her lieutenants for failing to find the child and everything. And that scene is where I was like, oh, she's Maleficent. Because there's that scene in Sleeping Beauty, Disney Sleeping yep. Beauty, where like she's just railing at her, her like goblins. Goblins, like, yeah. Yeah, like, why were you unable to find a baby? It's just a baby. And she's like losing her mind and everything. Yeah. So yeah, it's very interesting. And then she sends out, you know, the one trusted um 
kale. Uh, servant she has. Yeah, yeah right? So it's General just like, Kale, who's very mm-hmm. Darth Vader-like with his scary mask that's a skull yes. and like, yes. I am death personified. Yeah. So he is and yeah. apparently, so this is another funny behind the scenes fact. Apparently, Kale was named after a um, critic. film critic yeah. <laughs> that and George she, did not like. <laughs> yeah, she, and she was oddly like uh, flattered. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Because yeah. she didn't like any, like she didn't like Star Wars. She didn't like any yeah. of his shows. And and mm-hmm. he's like, fine, I'll make you my bad, bad guy. And she was like, but that's kind of flattering. Like I, <laughs> I, I live so much in your mind that I'm now a character. <laughs> I know. So great. I love it. So funny. Uh, So they end up going to, you know, traveling to the island. We have that great scene with uh, Mad Mardigan taking on kind of the feeding of Alora with the black root. And Willow's like, black root will make, you know, put hair on your chest. She doesn't want that. She's a princess. Yes. Yes. But he also takes that moment to declare that as the father of two children, he knows better what a baby needs. And so he's starting to have that that confidence and that assurance, he's trusting his instincts now. Exactly. He knows, like, he, he realizes he has this knowledge and this wisdom. Blackroot, uh, I believe, is considered to be vanilla. Yeah, I, that's so, what it looks like anyway. It looks like vanilla, yeah. yeah it looks like um, vanilla bean. Which, I don't know, have you ever had straight vanilla bean? No, I have a feeling it doesn't taste anything like... It doesn't taste... It doesn't taste good unless there's sugar added. I, yeah, I feel exactly. like it's very, very bitter, but... yeah. You know, a tasty with sugar, mm. Mm, <laughs> vanilla with sugar. <laughs> um, yep. But they end up getting to the island, and it is a place of death as well, covered in bones, just covered like in Baba Yaga's house, covered in bones. There's a like, there's a there's an island, and this felt so TLJ to me. Yep. Yes, like the island. Yes. The uh, it's just over there. <laughs> you know, hey, there's a boat. Um, yeah, you know. and all of his expectations for this powerful sorceress are disappointed. Just like yeah. Ray was completely disappointed when she discovered Luke. Like that was not what she expected. Well, and that's also Luke discovering Yoda, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Like also yes. that. So Finn Rizal is very Yoda Luke like in yes. in a Star Wars sense. You know. And she even says to herself, like, I'm a young, beautiful sorceress. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a young, beautiful woman. <laughs> and, and and actually, she's a crone. And, and we know that because she is literally abandoned in a, a desolate place in exile. Mm-hmm. Yep. And has is surrounded by bones and death because she has yep. died to the world. That's really, really mm-hmm. important from a femme archetype perspective, one that we haven't gotten in Star Wars mm-hmm. and you and I have talked a lot about. And yep. it's so cool to see all of these crones and evil women. Uh, and and not that Finn Rizal is evil, but she represents this like um powerful uh sort of dark energies because she's she hasn't been resurrected to become the sage yet. But that's the that's- thing. Each of each of those dark feminine ar- archetypes are here. Finn Rizal is the crone. Yeah. Bav Morda is the queen. And Sorsha is the maiden. Yeah. They're all there. Wild. Hey. I know. What, what, what are we going to do with all these fab archetypes? I don't know. I, I don't know. Just, just party, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so crazy. Love it. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, Finn Rizal uh, joins uh, quickly is like, oh, yeah, I'll come back with you. Now, now transform me. I must protect Dolora Dannon. That's my yeah. best Finn Rizal. Um, You're good at that. <laughs> <laughs> what? You're not a sorcerer. Yeah. <laughs> you must learn real magic, Willow. I, I, I love it. for the longest time, my husband and I, if one of us just said Willow, the other person would go Willow, because <laughs> her Willow is like so iconic, and it gets like stuck in your head when she's like Willow. Yeah. <laughs> especially, especially when she becomes the goat, and then she's yeah. like, bah! like when she's bah! <laughs> so funny. It's so good. Yeah. Oh, um. She the the actress herself, like who just basically voice acts most of the movie, does such a good job of the different like I've been transformed. Like it, yeah. it's just like yeah. it's so she's good. great. Um. <laughs> but we get Mad Mardigan who left on his way. Uh. Again, this is his own like supernatural intervention in a way because he is brought back directly to Alora Dan, and even though mm-hmm. he didn't betray them, there is that yep. quick like MacGuffin moment, like, did you betray it? No, like, no, we found them anyways without your help, and it's like, oh, okay, he's still good, yeah, yeah. Um, 
But we get the introduction of Sorsha and Madame Mardigan again. Yeah. And they're on their travel. We get the confrontation of Willow being like, Alora's crying. Yes. <laughs> He's so upset. <laughs> Let me help her. And uh, Mad Mardigan's like, I hate you. <laughs> yeah. I you, hate that woman. You mm-hmm. kicked me in the face. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, and, and again, to go back to the power dynamics at, at play here. At this point, he's still in the pink dress, but it's been stripped off the top half of his body. So he's basically the like, bear up top. And then yeah. he's just got this pink skirt on. And he's he's tied up, you know, so a little bit of like slave Leia going on. And then um, Sorsha is mounted. So she's above him. You know, yep. she holds power over him. She's still in her armor. Like you said, like she kicks him in the face. So she's being violent towards him. So it's just, again, like the reversal of the monster and the maiden here. He's the maiden. She's the monster. Absolutely. Yep. And so Mm -hmm. I did want to have a brief conversation about whether this classifies as dark union, because for sure, it's solidly enemies to lovers. They want to kill each other. They are on opposite sides of a very, very real war, Mm -hmm. right? They they hate each other. It's great. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. But does this classify as dark union? And You and I talked a little bit before that. And one of the keys to Dark Union is that there is, in the end, a uh, alchemical marriage that happens, which produces a combination or a marriage between two sides, right? So the feminine Mm -hmm. and the masculine, the dark and the light, things like that. And it ends up becoming uh, better and transformed for the world and makes the world better. Mm -hmm. Yes, that does happen. But also key to Dark Union is the uh, mistaken marriage, marriage, I'm using quotations, uh, that one of the characters engages in that is the uh, marriage to the dark or um, the wrong person that you end up marrying first or being engaged with. So Mm -hmm. um, there are examples of this, which is non-romantic, like uh, Ariel and the Sea Witch, uh, Mm -hmm. where she enters into a, a contract with the Sea Witch to be able to um, court Eric and Eric ends up being, um, you know, kind of taken in by the sea witch and Ariel ends up rescuing Mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, uh, Eric from the sea witch in the end. So that's like dark union classic. I would say because of the shared sort of metaphor of Alora and Sorsha um, and the seeking of Alora using Sorsha, it is actually classified as dark union because Sorsha and Alora are the same. Mm -hmm. Because Bovmorda needs to kill Alora to become all powerful, that is the seeking of the power. Using Sorsha as that is just part of it. But Sorsha, Mad Mardigan, and Alora are already a family in a fairy mm-hmm. tale mythic sense, even yep. if they haven't completed that part of the journey yet. Yep. Because they are set from the beginning to be that way. So yeah, anyways, that's their that's, destiny. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> it it is. It's just a little bit more weird in how it plays out because of the metaphors of both Alora and Sorsha being children of the queen. Mm-hmm. That's yep. all. So yep. yeah. nice. Yay, Dark Union. Yeah, Dark Union. Yeah. So they end up coming to the camp and we get the play out of the, um, you know, they're in a cage. Alora is with Sorsha, like in her bedroom. And Mm -hmm. Alora is already being taken care of by Sorsha, which also is that fate of her being her mother. Like, yeah, it's very like she's already caring for her. Like, I love that she actually tells Willow, like, I don't need help from a pack to take care of a baby. Like, that's yeah, it's such a good line. (laughs) It is. It is like and she's almost offended by it. The idea that I could be feminine. Yeah. (laughs) I know how to do this. I know how to yeah. nurture. Who's yep. <laughs> and we have Mad Mardigan and Willow and, of course, uh, Finrazel and the brownies all, like, captured, right? And the brownies are like, we'll get you out of there. And um, it, Willow is working on his trying to transform Finrazel back. Right. And so he he's, like, grinding things and he's, like, and Mad Martin's like, that smells. <laughs> it's like, this yep. is the power of the universe. It's like, well, it smells. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I, so I, I really like this scene just because, you know, it is a transformation. So it's really, really important, you know, mythologically in the story. It's important for Willow because 
you know, he brought the wand to Finn Rizal thinking that she was going to take it and then do any magic required. And he found out that she can't do magic in her current state. So he has to do it. And he still kind of lacks confidence. He's not really sure that he can, he struggles with it. And so he isn't really able, um, he, he tries, he can't get her back to her original form. Um, so he tries to transform her and, um, in one particular point, it says that three drops of his blood are needed for the transformation po- potion. So this is a huge fairy tale motif that I wanted to bring up. Um, blood sacrifice is super common to any kind of healing or transformation spells. You, almost all healing and transformation spells will require some kind of blood sacrifice, um, either literal or figurative. Um, so again, not you know, not 100% of the time, but very, very frequently, the life force must be offered in order to revive someone. Mm -hmm. Blood is very similar uh, mythologically to breath, tears, Mm -hmm. saliva. These are sort of, you know, the matter, the the life force is contained in these things. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, a kiss is technically a transfer of saliva, which is why the kiss of life will. And and breath too. Right. Right, Exactly. And breath. Yeah, exactly. Which is why it brings someone back. Breathing life into somebody. And Mm -hmm. and the the reason for that is because life and death are, you know, a a breath away from each other. And so to have somebody cross over from these things or transform is you either have to die or there has to be death on the line right yeah. exactly so um and specifically in the case of blood uh so in medieval medicine blood was one of the four humors that determined health and balance with nature and of course we know balance is a huge star wars theme and each humors ha- had properties of temperature and moisture so either dry or wet hot or cold that associated it with a season blood as a hot and wet humor was associated with spring, which is a time of new growth and regeneration. So blood in medieval philosophy and physiology was the means of rebirth. And then obviously Mm -hmm. we also know that, you know, like with a literal birth, um, childbirth, there's obviously blood and everything. So, and also like the, um, the start of a new menstrual cycle is exactly yeah that too exactly blood and yeah there's lots of like nature related things that tie into this right so three drops of willow's blood is you know not only just in general like symbolically this is him creating the transformation and the rebirth but it's also it's to the extent that he has the role as a mother this is Mm -hmm. his woman's blood that he is giving in order to enable this transformation yeah so cool it is so cool. Uh, and then we get the play out of Mad Morgan's trying to escape the cage and the brownies are like, I will give you fate to intervene. And yep. he gets hit by the potion. Woo-hoo! I, love, I love this moment so much. And he's like, I feel great. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Velcomer yeah. acting really, really high on love potion is super entertaining. <laughs> super entertaining. And then uh, so he enters. They, they're going to get Alora back. And Willow's like, I'll go. I'm the short one. And Velcomer is like, I've done this before. Before. Like it's like yep. what when yep. <laughs> I have the most experience. It's like I, to this point, Willow has never believed really anything he has said, except yep. he again people don't lie in this. Mm-hmm. You know, very rarely, right? Um, and so he sneaks in. He sees Alora in the little cradle, and then he sees Sorsha yes. laying in in her bed, and he's like, "The oh, the acting is so good," and he's like, it's- "Ah, drawn to her." <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, she's so beautiful. And the way she's lit and every, the way she's laying there, her hair and everything, like, it's the most feminine she's looked in the entire film so far. And he just, just like, completely shuts down. <laughs> he can't yeah. function. <laughs> my moon, my sun, my stars. <laughs> He's, like, starts You're spouting beautiful. poetry. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and 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 she like points the knife at him and is like, "Oh, oh yeah, one more move and I'll really make you a woman." <laughs> yes, yes, and we get so we get the first dagger to the throat, which is so great because then like a scene later it swaps and then he's got a dagger to her throat. Yeah. So like you know like it's it's everyone every enemy to lover fan's favorite moment, which is the dagger to the throat. Where <laughs> is it really enemies to lovers if you don't get that moment? <laughs> I mean, unless there's there's like real death threatened yeah like you it it really i don't think it can classify but that's just agreed. my opinion um agreed 
death has got to be on the line. Yeah. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. he, he just is absolutely smitten with her, cannot figure out, you know, how he can live without her. And then Willow's like, we got to (laughs) go. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. She's like, you wait, you stole the baby deception. You meant none of this. Yeah, but and she's not mad that he stole the baby. She's mad that it, it, she believes his love is a lie because she was totally taken in by it. She was yeah. just like really just impressed. Wait, 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 this is this is an option. I don't have to be like the weird virginal warrior of my mother my whole life, huh? Yeah, cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. she's she's very overwhelmed, uh, you know, by her feelings and by his uh, by his uh, response to her, and so you know she's. She's fascinating by it. And it's neat because you do see the shift in both of them after this. So even though the love potion wears off by the time the next scene rolls around, both of them now suddenly are like questioning their feelings towards one another. Because the love potion evokes you know mad mardigan to act but also for her to respond and Mm -hmm. like his actions end up contributing or giving her the love potion yeah yeah it's good, yeah. It's good stuff it's so, so they great. so they escape and mad mardigan ends up sh- proving he is actually the greatest swordsman in the world uh wow you are really good at the sword yes <laughs> and then he crap falls <laughs> yeah and then they have the excellent escape on the toboggan yes it's so Down good it's so good uh i oh, read somewhere it. that uh warwick davis said that that reaction is real <laughs> I was yeah. actually very scared at points. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So they, they so go good. down the mountain. There's some really, really funny comedic physical humor with the uh, Mad Mardigan falling off and becoming the giant snowball. Yeah. And, like, <laughs> and then like, you know, the hitting the hitting the small village below and like, oh, it's so mm-hmm. it's just fun. <laughs> it's it's charming. It's really, it's really fun. And then they immediately move into, you know, because the um, Sorsha and the Nakmar soldiers are coming for them, they hide and they discover in their hiding place, there's Eric, um, you know, his old buddy again. And, you know, they talk about how they were, you know, they, they lost the battle and they, they've been decimated and they, you know, they're, they're the only ones left and everything. And you, there comes this moment where Eric has to ask Mad Mardigan to declare his allegiance. Are you a thief or, you know, are you willing to fight with us? And up to this point, he's refused the whole time. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, he's leaned into his role as this rogue. He's also been using that term peck, which is really kind of a slur basically for the no ones the whole time. And finally confronted now again with this question of his allegiance, he says, I serve the Nelwyn. And this is the moment because he becomes a servant leader by saying, I serve, Mm -hmm. you know, and he used the proper term Nelwyn indicating, you know, his respect for him. So this is a big moment for Mad Martin. And that's what opens up, you know, for later for him to actually become a leader and a warrior. Exactly. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Sorsha ends up, you know, sneak like trying to find them and recaptured so that it Mm -hmm. allows them to escape which is so good yeah yeah so now he gets a dagger at her throat and it's awesome and (laughs) and they ride off and again you see you see willow independently with elora strapped to him he's able to jump onto this horse or pony or whatever it is and ride off. And it's the first time he's been able to do that by himself without assistance from someone. Yeah. And so again, he's continuing to like lean into the, that hero role and realize, you know, he is capable and he can do this. And, and so it's really fun to, to watch him become more confident. There's a, there's a really great uh, sort of mirroring that happens as they go off kind of into the stone labyrinth uh, mm-hmm. valley area that um, Sorsha ends up uh, escaping from. Mm-hmm. But uh, we have Willow carrying Alora, and we have, although with knife at throat, we have Mad Mardigan with Sorsha. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that. he's like holding her. her he's, he's, he's like, kind you're, of embracing you're holding her. me too tight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it, it and it's to show this like paired, like I, I need to bring my anima with me on this journey. Mm-hmm. I need to have my interconnected feminine Mm -hmm. for both of them yeah yeah Yeah. like both of them are really just kind of holding you know holding that feminine to them yeah it's fascinating it's good it's good Mm -hmm. they arrive at tears lean after sorsha you know manages to escape so it didn't take her much Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
Yeah, Mad Morgan really didn't want to hurt her. They arrive at Tearsleen and it's a cursed kingdom. It looks destroyed. Although, like, underneath you can definitely tell it has, like, this Disney castle Mm -hmm. appearance. Like, it is the fantasy land. Again, a lot of play of um, the music and the score does a lot of heavy lifting for the magic of Mm -hmm. Willow, right? Like, "Ah," there's a lot of choral and, like, magical sounds that do a lot of the heavy lifting uh, Mm -hmm. with the fantasy. We find out that, like, this is never in the movie why they're cursed, but they were cursed by Bavmorda. We find out just in a StarWars.com article <laughs> that Sorsha's father is, in fact, the noble hearted king of Tirazlin. Mm. And he was seduced and manipulated by Bavmorda, and she left and defiled the kingdom, taking baby young Sorsha away and raising her on her own. Um, and the good king is. Amongst those encased in the stone of Tirasleen, um, it's a, in a deleted scene from Willow. Yeah, and uh, there was there's a scene um, where her father psychically communicates with her later on that mm. is deleted that <laughs> basically convinces her to, to to go after Bavmorda and like protect Alora and you know switch sides so we don't get that in the film so we can assume it doesn't happen but we do know the king standing at the end of the movie is source's father so question right mm-hmm. in a couple scenes later uh mad martigan finds that golden armor where we led to believe that was the king's armor maybe so he okay, wears so- the king's armor he is now if that king. if that's true, like I said before, you know, Tira's lean seems to be drawn to an extent from Tirna Nog. So, given this fact, it sounds like there's m- more drawn from that particular myth because there, um, the ruler of Tirna Nog is a man who wears a golden helmet, and he has a golden haired wife and daughter. Wow. So, yeah. I mean, I think we can assume that Mad Mardigan ends up becoming the cure- king of yes. Tira's right, exactly. Lane. So he he said he was the king of Kashmir, but he's actually the king destined of of Tirasleen. Tirasleen, which is a good king and queen will raise her. Yep, exactly. Right? So so all all aligning in Willow speak w- Willow world, <laughs> but mm-hmm. I just I think it's super fascinating that although the original writers felt like they needed more motivation for Sorsha, that mm-hmm. innately psychologically because of the Sorsha. Alora connection, both being daughters of the, you know, evil dark mother. Uh, mm-hmm. It actually works that she flips sides and cares about the baby and cares about Matt yeah. again and cares about the this faded family that ends up kind of taking place. I just, it, they thought that they needed to explain her daughter's flip, the daughter flip like sources flip but they cut it and it doesn't yeah. it didn't need it yeah in the end i think it works fine and i do i mean as much as you know as we said the, the gender presentation doesn't necessarily indicate you know what archetype the the character fulfills uh, or represents um that said i i prefer her story without the influence of a masculine character yeah. on her just on her decision like she ultimately has to make this choice herself and I like she, that. She ultimately does make that choice herself when presented with um, Mad Mardigan kind of on his back. And she's like, well, no, I don't want that. Right. So yeah. In that fight that ends up happening. There's so many cool things that happen during this fight. Like Willow tries to use borrowed magic and it's unsuccessful. Yep. And so yep. ends up using um, the wand uh, with the encouragement of Finn Rizal, of course, like use the wand on that troll willow. Um, and he does, but he is unable to control his power. And so it turns it into a more powerful monster yep. with double heads kind of showing how he is looking both one way and the other to the future and to the past and is stuck in between metaphorically. Mm-hmm. The monster yeah. of indecision is worse than any other monster. Mm-hmm. That's what the, yeah. the weird dragon double-headed creature represents. It breathes fire too. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's his doubts made manifest. It's really interesting. And as you said, it does fulfill his his children's prediction that he would face trolls and dragons. And, you know, and, yeah. and it's even more interesting that, they, that the dragon is, in fact, created almost from his fear in a way. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like, 
again, there's like this self-manifesting aspect to the world that the things you most fear become reality. And if you don't fear, right, there, this mm-hmm. is the George Lucasian concepts, right? Fear, anger, danger, dark side. Uh, yep you know, love, connection, um, yeah. compassion, light side. Mm-hmm. And so if you believe in yourself and you have this belief in the future, that's what manifests. If you mm-hmm. fear, the fears will manifest. It's like your truth is your reality, right? Like yeah. it's, it's wild and yes. so Lucas. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And another thing that isn't it. Um, emphasized heavily in this scene, but is definitely there. And I wanted to call it out because it is again, very um, Lucasian is the fact that they spend at least a few shots, making it very clear that the battering ram did not come out of nowhere. They go back into, Mm -hmm. they retreat into the forest, they cut down trees and they bring them back so they can have a battering ram. So again, you have that destruction of the natural world, which, you know, as you often point out in Star Wars with mining and stuff like Mm -hmm. that, you know, this is a a dark side concept. And so it's very notable that the Nakmar soldiers, you know, are destroying nature as they are. They um, they aren't living sympathetically with the world. They aren't. Yes like you know existing in harmony and balance Mm -hmm. right they are destroying and destruction which is you know so classically it's lord of the rings too like it is tolkien yeah he has that heavily in his like with the ants and everything the ants and with the uh the uh ogres and the um like what ends up happening with uh suraman and the second tower or the Mm -hmm. tower and yeah like all of that and like how it they they basically cut down the the forest to make um more army you know like mm-hmm. it, yeah um i do absolutely love that moment where sorcia turns i think it's really great because that's as simple as it needs to be yeah that's all you need you know and you don't and after that there's no time spent on you know how did this happen or do oh, we no, believe her sorcia has to go to fantasy jail and yeah. serve for her crimes and be in yep. front of a tribunal yeah <laughs> no. Like there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's no, you know, as people often joke about with Star Wars, space hag. Like there's none of that. Like <laughs> there's, there's no concept that it's just literally like no, it's she, she's on our side now, and that's the end of it. And then the next, you know, you get it confirmed again in the text of the story. Nothing is left to question when Kale tells Bavmorda that Sorsha turned on him. I did uh, want to talk about something because I haven't figured it out. 100%. So I'm going to I'm going to mm-hmm. lay it out and then maybe if we can't figure it out our listeners can contribute to the conversation too after. Okay. Which is Willow's arm hurts every time he uses the wand cuz he always grabs his You're arm. Right. He does. He grabs his arm. You're yeah. right. Um I mean he doesn't at the at the end of the movie, you know, when spoilers, does, but like he does the pig trick with Alora. Well the, his the pig arm trick hurts he doesn't. Too. But is that the case? I'm, I'm thinking of the very last transformation he does. He throws, the, I think he throws the rock up in he the throw, air. And he throws the, bird. the like peach or apple or yeah, bird. that's right. Yeah. It's like an apple, and then it becomes a bird. So he does that, and I but don't it's think only when he uses the wand. Yeah, is it because it's borrowed power? I I think so because okay. I think that's the whole thing. Is it's a, I think it's about him discovering Bring his, his own, own power. power. Okay. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. I would love to hear what people think of that because I love that that there's like mm-hmm. a backlash to using borrowed power. Like, yeah. You have to use your own power, and if you're using borrowed power, it's still kind of um, there's a cost. Yeah. And to go back to you know? why I think this story as a as a um a feminine focused fantasy is is so much more successful than star wars especially the sequel trilogy you know what happens with ray at the end she wins by wielding not one saber that originally but belonged to someone else two but two sabers that originally power belonged to yeah exactly yeah. and and it literally kills her and then that you know, but then there's there's never any indication that she ever understood that discovered she her, her power, own power, her yeah. own power, and yeah. so it to, to all the way to the point of her even you know naming herself after the owners of of you know Again, this borrowed power. It's I could so go wild. on about how Ray needs to go on another journey, and she basically she does stopped her journey before being transformed. That's key, yeah. right? She never ended up having a rebirth and a transformation. She ended up just going back to a cleaner version of herself yeah. from the beginning of 
the sequel trilogy. Yeah. Um, but but compare yeah. that to this, where he discovers, you know, he like he experiments with the borrowed power and he has a reasonable degree of success with it. But as you said, it does have a cost. And eventually what he finds is not only does he have his own power, which which he can use, you know purely for creation and not destruction, but also it is something that the world has not seen before. It is something new. It is something which he brings to his community, Mm -hmm. which they haven't had before. And it came from inside his own elixir creation. Um, It it does, the wand and the hurt arm, it does remind me of Luke Skywalker and his loss of his hand because he's using his father's sword against his father, right? Like, so you can't Mm -hmm. do that. You have to use your own power. And he ends up making his own lightsaber which is his but in the end he doesn't even use that he still he, no, he doesn't away because yeah because yeah. It's his his love is his internal stuff i just right you know like i just there's something in that and i still haven't figured it 100 percent out because there's something more than i'm just it's on the edges yeah it, it is connected to your own power yeah and i don't want to get way. and i don't want to get too deep into it because obviously we're going to do this when we have sort of a, our pre-show conversation for willow but i'm very curious to see you know what they give him when he returns in that story because it looks like he has a staff of some kind yeah so I'm curious what did he make the staff where do you get the staff from is did it did it come from the high old wind like you know is he, did he make his own yeah exactly yeah. so that'll be interesting to see Oops, good I'm excited to watch the previews and <laughs> talk about them because I've only watched them once so it'll be good yeah. to like rewatch them while we're doing stuff and they end up fighting off the knock Marians Sorsha joins them and they meet up with Eric uh army that he has mm-hmm. gathered the remnants right this is very like rebel alliance in yep. its orient right like it's whoever's left from all the armies that have been fighting the dark side um, yeah well what's their their kingdom called the one that was destroyed i forget what it's called uh, i forget yeah well anyway but like their oh galadorn that's it okay so their kingdom of galadorn was destroyed and so what i've seen is this being compared to alderaan is right. the king the yo know, their kingdom was destroyed and so now you know the stragglers from that um kingdom have come to join the rebels right um and so uh yeah the, so they connect with eric and his army they uh decide to head towards knockmare castle mm-hmm they are there and they're like, how, how are we going to do this? this? She's so terrible. And she proves her terribleness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Morda does by appearing in front of them in their in their sad and terrible state and turning them all into pigs. Yep. OK, let's talk about pigs. Why pigs? <laughs> mm. So it's interesting because the pigs are used obviously two different places, two different ways in this um, in this movie. There's the pig, obviously, for his disappearing pig trick, which is critical for the ending, which is really, really important. And of course, that pig is adorable and cute and not scary at all. And then there are the pigs when Bav Morda transforms the whole army and Mad Mordigan and even Sorsha, Mad Mordigan and even Sorsha into pigs. And so they they do mean different things. I don't think that they're closely related to be completely honest, but no, you might disagree. Not. Yeah, I think so. Within- I do think that there is a, uh, there's an aspect of him learning uh, uh, sort of his intuition out of mm-hmm. this, but that's, yeah. Yeah. I, I do yeah. think that they're separate. Yeah. So yeah. I think that in the case of the disappearing pig trick, um, a lot of times in fairy tales, a pig might be, a prince or princess in disguise or a, a hidden, a mm-hmm. secret prince and princess. And of course we know that when he swaps the, the um, at the end, when he makes Alora disappear, it's based on his disappearing pig trick. So the pig sort of was Alora. So she's there, the princess in disguise. And also in butchery and biology, pigs are considered uh, most similar to humans in a lot of ways. And they're used as a stand-in for humans in many situations. Um, so that's another reason why you see them used often in these situations. And in the case of the of Bav Morda's curse, it's really saying that they are beasts. They are no better than livestock. She does not view them as humans. She, yeah. you know, views them in, as you know, as implying possessions, ignorant, gluttonous, selfish nature. For yep. the Alora Danon connection, I actually think that there's a there's a mother goddess connection. Mm-hmm. 
with it in that in um you know dharmic beliefs in buddhism and in um you know some eastern centered on enlightenment sacred stories and mother goddesses links piglets are sort of the the children of mother earth Mm -hmm. and so the fact that it's like a piglet and then also allura is like the baby goddess reborn yes yes is that interconnection and i think i actually think that bev morda turning everybody into pigs which is quickly undone Mm -hmm. is a misunderstanding of her perspective of all of the people of the planet that they are worthless gluttonous hedonistic and you know, anti her patriarchal culture, she's trying to mm-hmm. enforce through violence on the on the world. But actually, everybody is a child of the goddess. Yes, every the everything is a child of the earth, and so that's why it's easily undone. So it's really interesting that you mentioned that because this kind of creates a good opportunity to bring up the last sort of name origin that I found that I okay. thought was. Super fascinating. So Daikini, which is the name for humans, the yeah. the humans, the big people in uh, in this world in Willow. So at the beginning, you know, when when uh, they discover Alora, uh, Willow says, "Oh, it looks like a Daikini baby. What are they? All oh, big giants from far away." So we know that you know all of the the humans in the story, and Alora specifically is you know a daughter of the Daikini. So um, this, again, is a, a reference to the, the same Eastern philosophy and mythology that you're referring to. Um, could come from Hindu or Buddhist mythology. It appears in both, but a different, slightly different spelling. Um, but Dakini is the feminine embodiment of enlightenment or liberation. And it's oh. very specifically feminine. Like it's always a feminine sort of goddess-like um, manifestation saying this is about enlightenment which you know is again that uh yeah so it's, it's what we've been talking about right the integration of the masculine and yeah. the feminine and and you know the the transformation it's all there and so once more feminine power is at the forefront in willow over and over and over again that's just wild and i don't doubt that george knows all these things Oh, yeah. And also had his notes checked by Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He transforms everybody back. He protects himself, which allows him to uh, give the gift of transformation back. Mm -hmm. So everybody is transformed at this point. Himself, he is protected. uh, And he has given the gift of transformation to say, Everybody, it's basically a mass baptism. It's really fascinating. So he yes. turns, he is able to turn Finn Rizal back into a sorceress. I love that scene where she's naked and she realizes she's old. I love yeah. that <laughs> moment so much. And she's like, oh, and she's like, I'll get you some clothes. And then they, they turn back all the pigs into, you know, this is this is sort of how you want to see the elixir transformed, transforming mm-hmm. the world, right? So he is bringing the elixir, he's bringing the the chance to be human again, back to people, right? And to care about each other. And they're, they're ba- bonded through their common experience. And then they're like, how do we attack? We don't have enough power, violence. And mm-hmm. so he says, well, you know, back home, we have a lot of gophers because he's a farmer. Yeah. Yep. And they hide in the ground, the earth, the mother earth. And it's yep. using his wisdom and intuition. This is very much like the wild woman archetype or mm-hmm. uh, the ancient wisdom and trusting in oneself and knowing that there is wisdom older than yourself. Yeah. Right? He's using the wild wisdom of the gophers. Yes. To trick Brav Morda into showing that he is better, you know, like, or that she doesn't have all of the power because she mm-hmm. doesn't understand the wild wisdom. Yes. Yes. It's so great. It's so great. And it's, it's amazing too, because, uh, you know, in this, this sequence, so he stands there with Finn Rizal, um, when all of the rest of the army has apparently fled. It's meant to look as though they have, they have all retreated and run away and it's just the two of them standing there he finally declares with confidence that they are the greatest sorcerers in the world and he touches kaya's braid Mm -hmm. he draws strength from that token and that tie to her and knowing that she's with him um you know before 
they act out their plan. He he has the the mini version of his animo with him, and so yes. he is more complete. Yes, uh, which is it, important because at this point you have to consider that he's been separated from his anima and Alora. You know, he's devastated mm-hmm. that she was captured, and um, I, you know, so so having this callback to his last interaction with his wife is so important because it shows that you know he does still have that. Um, that anima and that feminine wisdom with him. And in in a sense, you could say that he, in that moment, you know, has all three feminine archetypes with him. He's got the maiden, Alora, who he's going to go rescue. He's so she's literally the maiden in the tower at that point. He's got, uh, you know, the mother Kaya's in the rope, raid. the yes, rope to rescue the maiden in exactly. the tower. Exactly. And, and he's got the crone with him. The crone yeah. with him as, you know, yeah, as the result. result. So yeah. it's so great that it's just all there. It's everything he needs. So it tricks Bab Morta because she's like, I'm going to go after you. And again, fate being what it is in Willow, if you speak something, it becomes true. So him mm-hmm. saying her, her and like Finn Rizal and him are the greatest sorcerers in the world is true. Yes. Yes. Right. It's cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so Sorsha, or sorry, the, the gates open, the army comes out, and then the uh, a, a large version of the disappearing pig trick has happened. Right. So yes. It, the the army presents itself and they fight into the castle and fight the Nokmarians. Sorsha is, you know, finally on display that she has changed sides and um, Bav Morda was wrong. Mm-hmm. And we get the uh, Sorsha going to go fight her mother. She's like, I must go and fight my mother to mm-hmm. get the baby back. This is now my responsibility. I have assumed this through the relationship with Madden Mardigan and mm-hmm. through how fate has played out that I took care of the baby so she's not mine um <laughs> yep and uh we we end up finding very quickly that Sorsha is not the one to fight her mother mm-hmm. but we get the i mean amazing crone fight yes. oh it's so good because because bev Morda actually turns into a crone with the with the sacrifice of like going past like you're willing to sacrifice child officially she mm-hmm. turns like her her face almost melts palpatine like like yeah. they they use like the same makeup i think as palpatine under the eyes or just me without coffee in the morning <laughs> um, and they have this amazing fight and it's like literally the white witch versus the black witch like it's yeah like well they, witch, they like, actually have fire and ice powers which i yeah. thought was cool and it also kind of made sense because remember the people were like frozen back at tira's lane yeah. so it's like that's clearly her power and you mentioned the very beginning of the episode you know uh that she's kind of a snow queen of sorts so she yeah. does she has this like ice power Whereas Finn Rizal has this firepower. And so it's it's cool to see those two elements once again pitted against one another. And I love how they like are using like magic their complex magical spells in the beginning. And then they then they resort to like pulling each other's hair and scratching each other's faces and punching each yeah. other in the face. Yeah. Just, <laughs> because they're so evenly matched. Like, so this is the key is that, you know, they are evenly matched and it takes mm-hmm. something other, right? Something mm-hmm. somebody that is more whole. Yeah. Yep. to to you know find a solution to this to this problem and it's all about love and it's all about yes. um trusting your own intuition and it's all about your own internal power um mm-hmm. i did want to point out just briefly um i forgot to mention this but the gopher wisdom is him accepting the farmer part of himself yes Yes. And, and, you know, demonstrating the, the confidence that he, he does in fact know how to do this and he can do this and he can cultivate and he knows how. He, he can cultivate in multiple ways and find fulfillment from the knowledge that he has gained in all of the different aspects of himself. And that's the big thing to the wholeness aspect that I talked about at the start of the episode is that mm-hmm. all of the disparate portions of yourself, people try to pin you into being one thing or the other when really you are are you as a complete and whole person on you know in 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 your whole self bring yep. in your whole self right you are your whole self so the fight quickly ends up devolving and Rizel is you know hurt um and willow tries to use borrowed power again with the acorn yes yes i love this because it's so interesting because 
like you said, nothing in this is, is accidental. It's all, everything that is declared eventually comes true. And so when, you know, when I was watching the movie for the first time, I remember being so baffled by the fact that the magical acorns didn't get used for so long. And I was like, why, why were they gifted if they were never going to be used? And so I absolutely, absolutely love, 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 love that when they are ultimately used, it's to make for the last time the point you cannot use borrowed power. It has to come from you. Exactly. And so he realizes this when she fights him off and he takes Alora, you know, and hides her, right? Which is mm-hmm. a completely acceptable way to handle a situation in fairy tales. Hiding is is completely acceptable. Totally. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and and he says, you know, he's like, I have hidden her, but he has like the faux Alora in his hands as yep. part of the disappearing pig trick. And he's like, um, I will send her to a realm well where evil cannot touch her using um and he ends up using his own power his understanding of what Bravmorta knows and mm-hmm. what he knows and that it's still valuable even every time that he has done sort of magician work rather than f- true sorcery was still valuable mm-hmm. and that it comes with this uh this is the magic that you cannot know intuition before mm-hmm. yeah yep so he does the trick uh, and he still ends up having his arm hurt. Mm-hmm. Why? I don't know. That's definitely one where uh, I, 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 I feel question like mark, question mark, question mark, question mark for the audience. Like, yeah, I'm not sure. Listeners, let us know. I I do not know, but I love it. I love that yeah. he, because maybe he actually made made this real by expelling evil from the land. Yeah, it could be. The realm was here all along. Yeah, yeah. But, but I actually also love the way that even though he succeeds, he wins, you know, by doing this trick. At the same time, he personally is not the one who defeats defeat Bab Morda. Morda. She defeats Ultimately, herself. Yeah. She defeats herself. And I love that. And and I love it not only because it is still consistent with Star Wars, you know, most mm-hmm. of the time in Star Wars, the the evil does destroy itself. That is usually yeah. the what what happens. So out I like of hubris, that. out of yep. whatever. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Also, but she the other thing doesn't die. No, she doesn't. She doesn't. She just gets evil can't s- actually die. That's also no, but really also, important. but she gets sucked into the realm where she, that she had originally intended for Alora. Like yeah. she was trying to send Alora to this, you know, basically it's, like kind of underworld. And so yeah, she nether, gets sucked into world, yeah, another world. Yeah, another yeah, world she uses, and it's it's supposed to yeah. be. And this is again the the shadow uh, chronicle uh, mythos, as far as I know. Mm-hmm. It's the 13th realm and essentially it's where the circles of the world meet. A world between worlds, you <laughs> it's might say. It's a world between <laughs> worlds. So the circle of the world is earth, fire, uh, water, air. The circle of the flesh is fairy, lesser fairy, daikini, and melavoy, which is like evil creatures like orcs and stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. The circle of the spirit is life, death, hope, and despair. And where these circles interconnect is is the netherworld the 13th realm which is the world between worlds it is the force cool that's so cool into the energy of the universe okay yeah but here's one last thing on that though it is it is so huge but here's the the last thing i want to mention about like you know the the evil destroying itself and ending up being the victim of what it intended for yeah that's massive for its hero so we talked at the beginning about how this is basically a Sleeping Beauty story in many ways, yeah. or or at least in terms of how it handles dark feminine is very similar to Sleeping Beauty. So in Peralt's and other versions of Sleeping Beauty, um, again, the, the evil fairy who cursed Sleeping Beauty is eventually revealed to be the prince's mother. She's sort of an ogress. And, um, you know, she keeps trying to kill off the... <laughs> <laughs> the the prince and princess their children and everything mm-hmm. and um at one point she creates this pit of vipers and snakes and she's going to have uh the mother and children cast into this pit and at the last moment then her son uh, arrives to s- discover what she has done and she's so furious at her plan being foiled that she throws herself into the pit of vi- vipers and is so cool destroyed and so i'm like it's that basically like no one killed her she just ended up becoming a victim of her own evil and that's what happens to bav morda and so i really love that it's great 
It's so good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really key is like uh, evil will eventually destruct. There's a there's a there's a message in that about um, good conquers all overall, Mm -hmm. like very hope punk in its origin. Like if we keep at it long enough, evil will fall apart through. Yeah, well, it only has two. (laughs) It only has two options, right? Either it transforms and becomes not evil anymore, like Sorsha, or it destroys itself. Because yeah. it cannot do anything else. Because it has no aspect of creation in it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, so good. Uh, so we get the kind of end scene with the Daikini in Tira's lane, uh, mm-hmm. where the kingdom has been saved and is all pretty now. And there's like even banners and stuff like they've cleaned up the castle. And um, Sorsh is holding Alora, taking her role on as her new, you know, mother right officially Mm -hmm. and mad martigan is her father and we Mm -hmm. have grandpa the king of tears lane (laughs) like next to them uh who was transformed into a rock at some point but we did never got that story so that's what happened you're like who's that old man that's standing next to yeah right yeah exactly um kind of one of the weirdest things that happens in the movie there that you're like eh, it's fine uh some dude (laughs) but uh finn rizal gifts uh willow with a a book of magic and so this Mm -hmm. is like like the ultimate proof truth that he has transformed and integrated all of the aspects of himself he is now learning for himself all of Mm -hmm. the internal magic and reading is such a, a a unique thing because you take knowledge out there in the world that you've learned and it enters into your brain and it is transformed in your brain to become part of you. Everything mm-hmm. that you read becomes part of you, right? So it he is now the true sorcerer, sorcerer that he said he was to Bav Morda. Yes. And he returns to the village and the village, instead of sort of shunning him, is excited to see him. Mm-hmm. And he is the hero and he brings the elixir, the magic and his transformed self back because he has protected the world himself and the village yeah it's so great (laughs) he's welcomed back by not just the community but his wife yeah so he's reunited with kaya um kids yeah yes and his adorable children it's so great and then you know he demonstrates to everyone you know the sorcerer he has become by throwing up the apple and transforming it into a bird which notably by the way is similar to what um High Aldwin did. Uh, yeah. High Aldwin did at the beginning, but when the High Aldwin did it at the beginning, it actually um, was, was under was understood to be, yeah to be a mistake. Yeah. And ultimately, what did he tell him? He's like, "Oh, just follow the river because the river holds that you know that Magic, wisdom of fate, the, the ages." Power, yep, exactly. Follow yeah. follow your fate. Follow your fate. Exactly. So it's so interesting that that while that does repeat the way that Willow does it, indicates his own transformation yep. into the, you know, this sorcerer who draws on his own power and his own power, of course, is love. And in a classic George Lucas way, we get a poop joke with a bird yeah. <laughs> getting yes. pooped on by the bird, which mirrors, <laughs> which mirrors Alora Dan and puking yeah. on him. Right. Very similarly. Yes. So I, it's just, you know, full circle. He has turned his belief in fake magic into real magic. Mm-hmm. And it, his his hopes and dreams have become real. So good. Yeah. Hey, oh, Willow. Willow. <laughs> Willow. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, this was a blast. Yes. It's been so yeah. fun. So we will be back to talk about kind of our speculation around Willow closer to the release of the of the show. And also we'll be covering and deep diving the show Willow on this podcast because I think it deserves it. And it's my show. So I get to make those decisions. And <laughs> it's George Lucas. Like it, it they they know what they're doing, I feel. So it's gonna be inspired and I think it deserves to have a full a full what the force treatment. Yeah. Nice. Any final thoughts, Missy, on Willow or what we will uh, see? I, I, you know, without getting too much into the speculation now, because like you said, that's coming later. I'm really excited for this because I don't think I realized until we started digging into the movie, you know, how much it is centered around feminine power. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so seeing that and then realizing watching some trailers that rather than a group of guys with a token girl, it's more like a group group of girls, with, a group token of girls voice. with a token guy. Yeah. And it's yeah. like realizing that that's what we're going to get in the show. 
I'm very hopeful and very optimistic that we're going to get a continuation on this theme. And I'm really excited to see where that takes us. I feel like the shadow of Bev Morda will be across the show. I just feel like mm-hmm. we're going to get more Bev Morda somehow. Uh, she's a ghost. She's a monster from the shadows, mm-hmm. etc. Because you can never defeat, you can never kill evil. And it's just really, really important that she's still there as the shadow. It might be similar to the White Witch from Narnia, I'm thinking, in terms of treatment. So we'll see. Ooh, that would be I'm cool, excited. right? <laughs> yeah, I'm excited for speculation time mm-hmm. with Missy. And uh, I hope you all come back and appreciate our deep dive into Willow, which will, um, I guess, start immediately after I'm done running and or so just heads Mm -hmm. up on that. Thanks everyone for listening. And Missy, where can people find you if they're looking for more of your thoughts online? As of right now, the best place to find me is actually going to be Tumblr where I am all girls are princesses, all one word. And uh, mostly it's just filled with, you know, I I like to reblog funny shipping gifts. And uh, then I also do have my entire set of... (laughs) very long meta about uh, the sequel trilogy. Um, So you can find that there. And I'm going to be adding more over time. Awesome. Take care, everyone. Cheers. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host. Our music is orchestral music by Christy Carew for What the Force. We have a Patreon at patreon.com slash what the force we like to thank all our patrons especially those who love and are obsessed with what the force brad melody night huntress in wild space felicia how rude anna perez macau mom neil james joellen d christian luca josh johnson scott c and susan Make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube or leave a five-star review on iTunes or other pod apps. It helps people find the show. Check out our other channel on YouTube or other podcast feeds, What the Fiction. You can connect with us on Twitter at WT Force Show, What the Force Podcast on Facebook, or our website, whattheforce.ca, or on our Discord. Links are in the liner notes. Feel free to reach out and start a conversation. Cheers. <laughs>